All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, now it's time to try Scenario 19 and see if we can actually win a Scenario of Gloomhaven or if we'll continue to prove that we are just actually very bad at the game. Oh, uh, I asked for a small piece. Can I get like half of that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, she's just really trying to push the sunflower cake on me so that she doesn't have to eat it. Give me a giant piece. Um, okay, so before we do anything, well, first let's read the scenario rules to everyone. So we add three, thank you very much, perfect. We add three curse cards to each character's attack modifier deck as a scenario effect. So let's go ahead and do that. None of us ignore negative scenario effects yet. And then we actually need hail, I think. Hold on. I should have done this before. I forgot that we actually had to get hail out. I'm not going to show anything in here, but I think there's a in here. Maybe not. All right, that's fine. We can just do it like this. I know Hail is an Aether, but we don't have access to Aethers, so what we're going to do instead grab a Spellweaver for Hail. There we go. All right. So what are the rules here? Uh, Hail, A, is represented by a number token has four plus two times L hit points. She is an ally to you and enemy tall monster types. She acts on initiative 99 each round, performing move two towards the altar, opening doors and springing traps if necessary. The scenario is complete when she ends her turn in a hex adjacent to the altar. If Hale is killed, the scenario is lost. Okay, so L here is going to be three because we're, we're at four, but again, it's plus one from the solo bump. So three times two is six plus four. So she has 10 hit points. All right. And yeah, we got the curses. So there's there's some additional rules that we'll read when we, I guess I should place the things. We should get the number tokens out so we don't forget. So one, two, three, yep. Hey, what up? All right. So I think we're good to go. Got even just having the cake here, you can just smell the sunflower wafting off of it. <laughs> okay. Which is crazy because I got the coffee here, which has a strong smell as well, but the sunflower is somehow the overpowering smell here, which is really something. It's a shame too here. Let me actually, I guess I should have done this before starting the VOD, but it's a shame because it, it actually really turned out well. It looks great. I was so excited to eat it too, but yeah. Oh. Again, it really wasn't her fault. She was set up to fail with sunflower oil. Um, okay. So, Mr. Battle Goals. Uh, it's easier if I just do it like this. Okay, well, again, I mean, this is what's so unfortunate. Like I said, I, I really, I really do hate and to be clear, this isn't just because I'm doing base Gloomhaven. In Jaws Line, I felt the same way. There are just way too many battle goals that are just impossible for the Void Warden, which is really frustrating. I really wish that they would have just changed the rules such that it was considered when you gift an attack, you get credit for the kill. Which just kind of makes sense anyway, right? It's weird that if I gift you an attack, you get credit for the kill now. I don't know. I mean, I understand because you're the one doing the killing, but in terms of like rewarding people for playing their actions, this really... It feels bad, and it's very frustrating as a Void Warden because there are just so many um, battle goals you can't complete. This is another one. I'm never going to kill a monster by three or more damage because I don't make any attacks. I can make an attack three on something. Even? Can I even make an attack three? Yeah, I guess I could with my curse thing. Like, how, how am I going to overkill something with that, you know? So we'll try to take only long rests. 
at the end of the day, it's kind of the, the counterpoint to this is that obviously it's a little bit less of a big deal to not get battle goals for the Void Warden because you use your deck less. But the thing is, you do still use your deck a fair amount, especially once we get to higher level. You just don't get kills yourself. All right, never allow your hit points to drop below half or have one or more monsters present on the map at the beginning of every round during the scenario. Huh. Okay. I guess we can give this one a try. I don't think this is very likely. This is a pretty hard scenario, and I don't think I'm going to always stay below or above half. So there's a chance we do aggressor. I don't know. Kill one or more elite monsters or have five or more total cards. No, five or more total cards is just absolutely never happening here, so we'll try to kill an elite. Should just try to remember that. Chat, don't forget to remind me, since I am bad at that. Okay, so we got battle goals done. So we're ready to get set up. We need to take a look at our cards. Um... I don't think we want to make any switches here. Again, I don't think I need Black Boon anymore. The movement is okay. But I don't know if it's even that good. I mean, the bottom becomes more appealing now than the top, but I don't think I need it. I definitely don't think I want either of these cards. We do obviously have to swap in Strangle and Chain for something. Excuse me, for something. Similarly here, I think we're fine with all the cards we have. Okay, so Strangling Chain has to go in, so what's coming out? Not this, not this. Could be this, could be this, could be this, not this, could be this, not this, not this, not this. Okay, so let's grab the three cards that we could theoretically cut. Or the four cards, actually, sorry. And take a look at like how it'll change our deck if we cut one of them. Because the elements are an interesting thing to look at, right? Uh, so at this point, we've got another thing that which consumes fire now. The fire bonus here is sort of medium. Again, I played with this a fair amount, and yeah, sometimes you'll get it, but not that often. The initiatives are just difficult to line up all properly while all talk are targeting the same target, attacking the same target. So again, I mostly took this for the bottom and then sometimes the top. Hmm. This is still a bigger payoff, but it is difficult to get both of those set up at the same time. It just doesn't happen often. I think this is probably the best candidate. This can still give shield, and we can create light with this card and then get it with this which still works well enough. We also have a light creator here, and realistically, we don't have anything else to spend light on. But spending light here is typically worse than spending light here for us. So yeah, I think it just makes sense to cut shield that does at this point. We're giving up a good initiative. We added a 19, and we're still pretty fine on initiatives. Okay. But I want this, since I'm saying... I mean, I definitely... I could theoretically take either of these. The bottom fire... Like, the bottom version of... Yeah. Hmm. Maybe Flaming Sickle is actually better than the light generating one now, at least for this scenario. Immobilize doesn't do too much because of hail anyway. And there aren't that many. I mean, I don't know. Cultist is not very good against. Yeah, Bones it's fine against. I guess it is useful against Bones. It's just, if I do the bottom of Blinding Sickle or Flaming Sickle, I'd rather it be Flaming Sickle to create fire. And I am still basically always doing this every rest cycle, so I still have light into light. I don't really need another instance of light. Let's try going like this and see how this goes, now that we have something else that wants fire. I think it's close either way. Man, I really love red guard balance. It is just always so hard. Like... So, for example, in base Gloomhaven, I feel like you almost always... It's like almost always very easy to choose which cards to bring and which cards not to bring. There's very little choice, typically. Um, and... In Jaws Line, it's already much better, and in Red Guard, it's just like I never feel like I made the objectively correct choice on Red Guard, which is just great. It feels really good, even as a very experienced player, to regularly think that you know what, maybe I could have chosen, like maybe I should have done this differently. You know, it's like all this I want to tinker with. It is great. Like I, God, I, I cannot rave enough about how well designed Red Guard is. At least, I mean, again, I've only played Red Guard up to level five, but I, Red Guard design is just incredible. It's so good. Is everything I want to see from a class in Gloomhaven. Oh, we also get two more base or max HP here. It's also funny because when I when I first came, what about the demo? Oh, uh, I just haven't. It's not really fair for me to talk about the demo because. All right, so again, I I worked on Jaws the Lion in the development process. And back then, the demo was pretty OP, and there were a fair amount of nerfs to the demo while we were playing, but we had like a, we just were working more on the design process less than the development process. I don't know, I mean, it was difficult to explain. 
And so then it was passed off to playtesting. But the entire time the demo was playtested, um, I was out of the country. I mean, I was moving around. It was like a complicated period. That's why I was away from Gloomhaven for almost a year, just because of movement and everything like that. I just didn't have time. And so basically, I knew what the demo was back then. I have literally not even looked at the demo cards once of the current version of it. So I, I just don't have any clue of anything about the demo. I don't play with the demo because I just, I think that this, I mean, from what I've heard, the demo is the weakest of the classes in Jaws of the Lion, from basically everyone, and from certainly people whose opinions I respect. And also, this is just sort of like a perfect tri, the trifecta of classes, like the tank, support, and damage dealer. I mean, this is like the, the holy triangle of classes, sort of. So, yeah, I mean, it just kind of fits here. If I were going to switch in the demo, it would only be for the hatchet. But hatchet is also probably, again, from now, I mean, I've never played the demo, but I have played the hatchet. I would say probably the strongest cat class in Jaws of the Lion. Also, again, based off of feedback from people whose opinions I really respect. So it seems like I would just be making my party worse by switching out the hatchet for the demo, which is not something I'm typically in the habit of doing thing is that she has so much situational yeah that that's kind of what i understand also i mean i i don't know it seems a little bit weird to me but apparently the demo also has pretty bad initiatives or like kind of mediocre initiatives which is kind of weird for a a mostly melee class like a mostly melee nine card class to get kind of mediocre initiative Yeah, from what I understand, Dutch, the obstacle stuff on demo isn't even that, like, the most important aspect. I, from from my understanding, at least, it's more the initiatives that hold back the demo than the, the obstacle stuff not being in Gloomhaven. But yeah, I'd be interested to see that as well at some point. Um, okay, so... Yes, trying to play Hatchet, demo, and it is killing me. The initiatives, you mean, or just the demo in general? Or the situationalness? Wait, one second, I'm going to blow my nose. All right, back in general. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know. The combo is just killing my brain. Fair. Okay, okay, all right. So, what do we need to do here? We Basically, what we want to do this round, since we don't actually have any stuns in our party, except for one in the Void Warden. I mean, I guess, actually, that is a good point. So, kind of what we want to do is we want to crowd the cultists right we want to make it so they don't have space to summon or stun one of them i guess if we go down here with the void warden we can actually stun this one and then we can crowd this one and then hatchet can just kind of chill yeah that actually works that works pretty well so again it's a little bit risky to set up like this but the 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 numbers work right doing our bottom stun here um 58 Against cultists, that's good enough. What we care about cultists doing is a 63. And we can still set up and, again, stop this of the two cultists. I guess crowding only works if this bones doesn't move. So we do have to be careful about that. But if the red guard goes here, the bones is never moving. As long as the red guard goes there before the bones can move. The earliest the bones can move is 20. So we just have to go before 20, which shouldn't be too difficult. I mean, I guess I really do want to get shield spikes set up. So, yeah, we're pretty much just doing the standard first turn for the red guard. Which goes early enough. I mean, again, all right, so the cultists can go at 10 here and, like, go make an attack, and I won't have shield up for it. But if the cultists go at 10 this round, I'm not really worried, right? They're going to attack for, like, one damage. They don't even curse. Yeah, they're going to hit us for one damage. So we're going to take, like, two damage. It gives us a free turn anyway. So I don't need to play around them going at 10, even if after that it's going to kind of mess up the spots. But if they go at 10, I'm, mean, like, mess up our ability to crowd them is kind of what I mean. If they do this, though, then next round we'll still have one of them stunned, and we can probably just focus fire the other one. Uh, the way you play Gripe, you pretty much have monster initiatives memorized. I've noticed that a lot of your play takes that into consideration, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think that, again, I, I've said this before, I don't memorize all monster initiatives. I just memorize significant monster initiatives. I also don't actively try to memorize initiatives. It's just something that happens. I think, again, I actually was talking about this with Isaac last night. Um, well, all right. We were having a little bit of discussion where basically... That, all right, well, let me have a sip of coffee before it gets too cold. I 
Isaac Nemers and I were having a discussion about uh, party initiatives about the the shit post from a while ago on the subreddit about how their party or they had found a way to break down every different initiative into like very kind of little bit fast, very sort of fast, very very fast, you know, so that you could technically have a an initiative for every. I mean, you could have a phrase for every possible initiative in Gloomhaven that didn't actually say a number, so that you could communicate with your allies. And so we were talking about like what was in the spirit of the game and what wasn't. And so Themris was saying that, yeah, you know, that in their party, they most of the time would just completely forbid anything other than I'm going fast, medium, or slow. And so that, you know, people couldn't say I'm going my fastest, stuff like that. And I w- and so I actually made a counter-argument to this, which Isaac agreed with, which was that, to me, someone saying, like, I'm going to go my fastest, and then the rest of the party knowing what that means, it that doesn't bother me. Like, for example, if you're... So to to take this in the context of like the theme and adventuring, if you're like adventuring with a spellweaver and every time like you know you're in trouble, it's just like oh, I'll I'll do something as quickly as I can to try to solve this problem. Like you have an idea of how quickly that's going to be because you've I mean you over time you learn this right by by being in the group and adventuring with these people. So like the in theme idea of how this works doesn't bother me at all actually. To me, this makes sense that. Eventually, when the spellweaver says, I'm going to go as fast as I can, you know she's going to go at seven initiative because the more you adventure together, the better understanding you have of how you work together, right? So this just fits for me, and Isaac actually agrees. And so this is kind of also how I feel about memorizing monster initiatives. I don't think I would recommend, I mean, certainly people could do this if they wanted to. I would never, like, I, and to be clear, I basically never look at their deck, right? Um, when it's like a closed deck. Everything I've memorized from monster initiatives is just from playing against them, which I think also makes sense. Now, obviously, I've played across many different campaigns, so it's a little bit different. But I think it also makes sense that people in a campaign get better at dealing with monsters, right? They sort of like learn. It's sort of like the Witcher thing of like studying the monster you're against. It's sort of the same thing. You, the more you face them, the more you you just inherently memorize their initiatives, and the more you've memorized their initiatives the better you are against them, which also makes sense on, on a thematic level that your characters, the more they face certain monsters, the better they are at dealing with them. So yeah, I think this also, like, I think this is a perfectly reasonable thing. And it, to me, this is perfectly in the spirit of the game. But yes, obviously you're, you're not wrong that a lot of my thought process revolves around understanding monster initiatives. Um, you intu- intuitively learn them over time. Yep, absolutely. And again, it's not to say that I learn all their initiatives. Um, and obviously I'm a little bit rusty since I was off for a year, but again, I think you sort of learn the significant ones and sort of have ideas about other things. Like I know that, for example, Living Bones, I think on almost all monsters, you generally try to memorize, you, you innately memorize their fastest and then their scary cards, right? So again, Corpse fastest 21, easy. Fastest it can attack is 32. And then like after that, I don't even remember. It's like 40 something for maybe like move and attack. I should actually know that one, but I don't. 40 or 50 something. I'm not actually sure. At 32, it, it attacks without moving. At 21, it moves without attacking. Like, these are important to know. And then, you know, after that, it's, like, slower, so it doesn't matter so much. Cultus is kind of the same thing. Fast as it can move and attack is 10, but it's not very significant. 63 is when it summons. I They can heal. I don't even, I couldn't even tell you the initiative they heal. I think it's in the 20s. But, again, this just isn't very important, so I don't necessarily memorize that. Same thing here. Earliest initiative is going to be 12. This is shield and, and heal, but it doesn't move. It doesn't attack. At 20, they heal, move, and attack, but they have limited movement. And then after that, it's like 25 or something for just a normal turn from them. And here it's going to be 22 is the move and attack with Muddle, which is going to be their fastest initiative as well. And then it's like 33, low 30s is, I think it's 33, when they do the AoE attack, which is the really scary thing. So yeah, I mean, it's just, obviously there's an extent to which I memorize things, is what I should say. Okay, um... sunflower cake i'm like having a little bit of cake with the coffee is nice but i'm sort of hesitant it tastes so much like sunflowers which isn't to say that i don't like sunflowers i actually enjoy eating sunflower seeds but having a cake that tastes like sunflower seeds is sort of something Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is this. 
I'm going to set up all my persistent losses here because I think I can pretty easily afford to do it. Again, I this one will be stunned and I should I don't think there's any way that this can possibly that this will move. So I don't think there's any way that either of them can summon this turn. So I think we're covered for that. Redguard's going to go here. I'm actually going to have the hatchet go here. Um, but I'm going to go at 60. The reason I'm going to go at 60 is because I like the Living Bones just to attack the Red Guard first. The reason I want the Hatchet to go to here is because Hale's going to do a move 2 at 99. And I really like her only to move 1, not to move 2. If she moves 2, it's going to be a lot harder to get her to prevent her from opening the door too quickly. Um, and I'm just going to set up the favorite here. I could do my AoE attack here, but again, it's unless you're under a lot of pressure, it's typically going... Oh, make sure I didn't... I remember to... Yeah, I did on me myself. Unless you're immediately under a ton of pressure, it's typically better to set up the favorite and then attack rather than AoE and then favorite. The biggest reason for this is that, so playing the favorite now, I'm not actually doing any this anything this turn, but theoretically I, I kind of am. I'm giving myself at least, I mean, I'm giving myself attack three for next turn, which like for the turn, attack three is fine. And then obviously it's going to give me a lot more tempo over the course of the scenario. So unless it's going to be the difference between us killing an enemy that we really need to kill the first turn, I'm typically going to favorite first, favorite turn one. And again, we're not killing any enemies this turn, so... Okay. Uh, uh, I guess we're good. Give everything one more shuffle for good luck. Our shuffle for good luck last time worked. That wasn't really the problem. We actually had pretty decent luck last time. Alright, again, cultists to 10. This is always a possibility, but it's not a very big deal. So, they have minus one attack, minus one movement, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so they move for two attack for one. So this goes to here, and this goes to here. They're both focusing the red guard, because the red guard has the lowest initiative. And they both attack for one. Okay, no damage, and unfortunately we are forced to use a hide armor charge here, but it's not a big deal. Because I'd rather use it after I have the shield spikes up, but... So the bones, yep, that's the 74. That's the, <laughs> that's the one. Okay, um, so we're going to gain two experience. We're going to activate shield spikes. I'm going to have a sip of coffee. That is a thing. It really is. All right. So I should... I'm not a cake person either. So I actually don't hate cake. I'm not a huge fan of it, um, which isn't to say I don't like sweets. I do like sweets, probably more than I should, which is unfortunate. I mean, I, I, I'm normally pretty fit slash thin, but obviously confinement has, or lockdown has had an effect on that, unfortunately. But um, I still try to avoid sugar as much as I can, but if I'm going to eat sugar, I prefer just to have like chocolate, which is really my thing. Also, I agree completely. Pie, 100% better than cake. Pie is definitely the truth. Oh, especially it's pumpkin pie season soon. Oh yeah. That, that's actually something that excites me. Oh, good pumpkin pie. But, um, so it's not so much that I hate cake, but this cake, it's just, um, but I, I also really hate wasting food, which is the reason why I am going to help eat this, but it's just, uh, it's rough. We don't even have wedding cake. We had a chocolate fountain. Oh, we didn't even... Yeah, I respect that completely. Also, wedding cake is kind of... Like, cakey cake is the worst kind of cake. Again, no offense to anyone that likes it. Obviously, different strokes for different folks, but... Well, cakey cake is really... Like, to me, the only kind of cakes I like is, like, what's called, like, fondant au chocolat. So, this is, like... I think in the U.S., this is typically going to be called flourless chocolate cake, although it's not exactly the same thing. But it's a very dense, thick... Not fudgy quite, but I don't know. Difficult to describe. But that's, like, a good cake to me. This... This is more cakey cake, although this isn't completely cakey cake. But yeah, wedding cake is rough. Knowing Themris just from chatting here, I bet he loves cake. <laughs> oh, for sure. Okay, so the, the Bones is going to hit and multi-attack someone, so it's certainly better that it attacks the Red Guard, who has a bit of shield, than someone else. Um, so we have a move to jump, so we're going to use it. It also makes sense to go like this, right? Because then Hale's going to go here, we stun this one, and then next round this one can't summon because it doesn't have space to, and then this one won't summon because it's stunned. So it makes sense to go here and gain one shield. All right, so then the Void Warden goes, so we're going to activate this. I'm just going to give two experiences across the board. We all got our two XP. And we're going to activate that, and we're going to give ourselves the last curse. Ha! All the curses. What now, elite cultists? Elite cultists do curse now, don't they? Yeah. 
I guess we won't be seeing any of those anytime soon, though. Um, and then we're going to do stun range 3, and we're going to stun, again, this one down here. And be done. So then the hatchet goes, we activate the favorite, which I have already given myself the experience for. Excuse me. And then I'm going to do a move 3, creating wind. And I'm actually going to move to that's tough. Mm, hold on. Yeah, damn it. It's annoying because I don't really want to be here because then I'm going to have disadvantage. I mean, I'm going to use my goggles, but I'm not going to have advantage attacking this one next turn. But if I do this to gain advantage, then Hale's getting close to the door, which I don't want. I think I'd rather have Hale be here. So yeah, I guess I'm staying here. I'll just deal with the disadvantage. Whatever. It's just one attack. Three curses in our deck. It's not insignificant, but... Okay, and so then this Bones is going to attack. Oh, they're attacking for three already at this difficulty level. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's some respectable damage. Okay, so there's going to be two attack threes on the red guard. Well, that's fine. Okay, so the first one, we have one shield, so we have three shield, four. I would have just always used it, because who knows, they could have missed on the second attack. So we take no damage from the first one, three retaliate, and the second we take three damage. Okay. And then we'll do one retaliate. So we do four total retaliate. Not bad. I mean, the first two turns for the Hatchet are, at low levels, pretty much always exactly the same, right? It's time for Disorienting Barrage. Even if it's going to not have advantage here, this is still fine. This is definitely the, the best way to deal damage overall in this room. So with an attack two here, we should typically deal one damage. So it would be good to deal two more damage there. Sorry, I think I'm a bit lost. What's the Spellweaver doing there? Uh, the Spellweaver... Oh, sorry, we forgot to move her. Good call. The Spellweaver is Hail. Um... So for this scenario, we have to escort Hale, who has 10 hit points, and basically she has to make it... I think the altar probably should be placed. I think it actually should be, with the token on top of it. Basically, yeah. I, whatever, we know it's here. There's, there's an altar here, and when she ends her turn next to it, we win, and if she ever dies, we lose. She's just... Rather than just using a number token for her, we're giving her a little bit more life. Sorry, but I did forget to move her. Good catch. Okay, so, uh, um, direct damage is good here. No problem. I don't have any elements. Pulling doesn't really do anything. Uh, did you ever try to do a campaign with all chaotic choices? So you mean by chaotic choices, also hey again, Bebe. by chaotic choices, do you mean evil choices? Like the, the bad guy choices? Like negative rep choices? Or do you just mean randomly choosing? I assume you mean the former, not the latter, but I'm not sure. Because chaotic... I don't know. It's not quite the word I would have used. But yeah, that's fair. Uh, but no, I have never. I don't know. It just... It feels wrong. <laughs> it's funny because I joke about how I'm not at all a role player, but I guess it hurt a little bit still so I don't know this is basically as good as this bottom can't collect D&D &D evil yep yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no I have not I have not I mean I've tested some of them before and obviously I've seen a lot of the stuff that it results in it's just really never worth it a race to get Eclipse? Nah, yeah, exactly. Also, yeah, you can get Eclipse, probably the worst designed character in Gloomhaven, or you can get my favorite character in Gloomhaven. <laughs> I mean, it's a tough choice.
Uh, all right, I'm back. Sorry. Um, I haven't unlocked Eclipse. Is it as good as they say? It is probably better than they say. <sighs> oh, crap. I forgot. Uh, Dwarf provided that link earlier. There we go. I just need to open this. I was supposed to do this in between scenarios. I actually forgot to, but I'll keep it for later. About Frost Haven and Jaws Line stuff. Eclipse is the most broken class in Gloomhaven by a significant margin. It's just, I don't know. I mean, Eclipse doesn't care at all about difficulty level. There's nothing you can do to make things really more difficult for Eclipse on average. And on top of that, Eclipse can solo most. <laughs> Eclipse, can, Eclipse can solo most um, two player scenarios in Gloomhaven, which, I mean, yeah, that, that basically says all there is to say at any difficulty level. So the biggest problem then with Eclipse is that when you play with an Eclipse in your party, a lot of the times you're going to be like, all right, discussion time. What are we going to do? You know, your teammates are going to be like, yeah, let's, well, all right, I can do a bit of damage there if you can finish that one off, you know, or, well, or we can do this, we can do that. And Eclipse is going to be like, nah, it doesn't matter. And you're like, well, what doesn't matter? And the Eclipse is going to be like, well, anything. And you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Obviously, what we do matters. And Eclipse is like, no, it really doesn't matter. And I'm not going to explain why it doesn't matter, but this is basically the issue. So. Eclipse just doesn't care about having a party at all, and doesn't the party doesn't really, I mean, except for a couple things that the party can do for Eclipse, which is also not very interesting interaction, Eclipse doesn't really care about having party members, and the party members don't interact at all with what Eclipse does. And Eclipse just wins. So yeah, it is really, really as bad as you can imagine. Um, also, to be clear, uh, the Ubiquit, Ubiquit uh, is trolling. Uh, well, obviously with the, the Kappa. Um, all right. From what I understand, the new Frost Haven status is affect Bane serves to replace execute mechanics. Would you say it's a good idea to already start using it in Gloomhaven instead of execute? Absolutely, Banjo. I would 100, 1,000 percent recommend replacing every instance of execute in base Gloomhaven with Bane, and I think you'll make Gloomhaven much better for yourself. For everyone that doesn't know, the Ubiquit, I don't know how it should be pronounced, but um, he's just trolling. He's a fellow Frosthaven tester. He's actually someone who I play with a fair amount. His name is Beber. And uh, he he's very good at Gloomhaven as well. He certainly knows what he's talking about. So if he's trying to tell you nonsense like Eclipse is balanced, he's just trolling. Oh, gotcha. For red, uh, yeah. All right, um... So, this and this. So again, the biggest thing here is I just really want... I mean, this sort of sucks because I'm double creating fire. I guess this is the argument for why the light was good. But at the same time, without having shield of the desert, I don't really care so much about having fire and light in the same turn. I mean, I guess theoretically, because I can do double shield from that. I don't know. So maybe... Yeah, this is one time already where I wish I was playing at the light card, not the fire card. I mean, I was playing blazing sickle rather than flaming sickle. Um... But anyway, I just really want to do two direct damage here, because two direct damage plus the attack from Hatchet kills this Bones. While it's also still four total damage for my turn, and one shield is not bad here, since this should still attack me. Unless it summons, in which case it's not doing anything, and that's also fine. I mean, I guess it, it can also heal, which is not that big of a deal, right? Okay, so those turns are pretty straightforward. So what are we going to be up to on the Void Warden, is the real question here. Um... Probably just gifting an attack. Honestly, we could just gift a Wicked Scratch here and save Gift of the Void for later. Or we could do Gift of the Void first and Wicked Scratch later, since that ordering makes a little more sense, because the sooner we get poison, the better. Yeah, that's probably good. So if we're doing this top, what are we doing on bottom? Are we creating... So we are creating fire, but we typically want fire. We have wind, which we can use. Oh yeah, we don't have dark. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. It's just wind that we can use. So wind's going to get you just on Gift of the Void. So the thing is, we don't need to move, so it would be nice to have a non-move bottom here. I mean, I guess we can use Taunting Fate. I just don't really want to waste my good initiative here. Just add one to this Gift of the Void. 
I'd probably rather save that for next turn, because this turn we're pretty safe. Next turn initiative seems like it could matter more than here. But I also don't want to use the bottom Wicked Scratch, which is a nice non-move bottom, simply because I want to attack with Wicked Scratch next turn. So I'm probably just discarding one of these cards here. Again, I don't care so much about initiative. I guess I kind of do, because we could kill this one. We're not really going to kill this one this turn, and it attacking isn't an issue, and it's, I mean, nothing it does is really an issue. So yeah, going later is probably better. So let's just play one of these. I guess the Disarm is just not going to be very good here or in the next room, so we can just discard this, basically. Okay. Now 31, that's going to be the heal, isn't it? Yep. Okay, so Hatch is up first. We're going to use the bottom of Fancy Hat and the top of Disorienting Barrage in a very surprising combination. And we're going to attack here, here, and here in that order. We I don't really want to throw the favorite in this room, because I don't want to have to move back to pick it up as the biggest issue. The favorite here wouldn't be bad, but then it would be dis I mean it would be not advantaged, which seems pretty rough. Hmm. I just don't want to have to move over there. I mean I could move here at some point, but Hale's already going to have gone past. I guess we can go to here and Hale doesn't advance at all then. It seems risky to throw the favorite in here, and it, it seems risky and unnecessary, at least this turn. Maybe there's a world in which we'll throw it next turn, but I don't think it's necessary to throw it this turn. Because even if we end up needing, like, even if we end up throwing the favorite and we re can retrieval it, we can also throw the favorite, kill something with it, and then retrieval it back that same turn as well, or just move on to it. So I think this is fine, rather than having to retrieval it and then throw it, which means we're still one turn behind in terms of recovering it. We're going to use the goggles, obviously. Oh, we forgot to get a small item on Red Guard. We should have another small item there. Oh, well, too late. Forgot we're level 3 there. Uh, let's try to set up properly. So, Disorienting Barrage. 2, 9, 4. So the first one is not advantaged. Okay, nice. And then here and here. These are advantaged. Okay, so that's 1. And that's 2. Or, I mean, no, that's 3. There's 1 because it's a shield. That's 3 there. Yep, this works out well enough. And, well, I guess, honestly, only that model matters. This one's healing, so I don't need to place that model. Okay, um, so now the red guard goes. We're just going to do these two things. So we're going to do this first so that we get to loot some coins. Because we're getting close to our fire enhancement. So we're going to do shield one on top. And one direct damage to everything. There's nothing I can pull. No. There's no way I can pull anything in a meaningful way here, unfortunately. So it's two direct damage to everything nearby. Oops. So you're dead. And we loot this. We have shield, which doesn't matter at all. And we created fire. Okay, so now the cultist goes and is going to heal himself for three, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, yep, doesn't move at all. And then the void warden's up. So on the void warden, we're going to use gift of the void. We're going to create dark. We're going to consume the wind with this attack. You suffer two damage, poison one. Yeah, we don't need to move first, although we will be moving. Anyway, attacking, oh sorry, this one, this one here, because this is not a disadvantaged attack, oops, and so this is going to be with uh, Hatchet, attacking with advantage. Come on, can we get rid of one of these curses? Come on. Alright, whatever. So this is a 5 plus 1 for the modifier, so 6. And then we're just going to use the bottom of Lure of the Void to do a default move to here. And again, moving here just prevents Hail from advancing, which is definitely something I... I'm in for. Okay. So if I attack here, this just dies. Do I have a ranged attack then? No, I, uh, I guess I can attack with this as a top. Because, so here the bottom of 
Wrath of the Sun or whatever it's called. War no, it's Wrath of the Sun, right? Yeah, Warrior of the Sun. The bottom Warrior of the Sun is actually good enough, typically. I mean, obviously we can miss, but if we miss, we even have insurance policy then, right? So we make this bottom attack here, killing you, and then we attack here. Now, in this turn, actually, the 10 would be bad for us, but they're 1 out of 6 to go for a 10 here, so I don't think it makes sense to play around that. The only way we could play around that is by having a worse turn and just playing this for initiative, which I don't think is, is correct. And worst case scenario, if they go for the 10, we'll probably just like disarm this one. I don't know. Now, if they go for the 10, it is actually going to be a rough turn for us because we're really planning on killing here. Again, it's 1 out of 6. I think it's correct to play around, not play around it here. Okay. Um, so we can just get a free curse here by doing this and gift an attack with this. So then us, we can kind of just do whatever we want here because enemies should all be dead. Um, and I guess... That's just going to be making some sort of an attack. Does the Red Guard need healing? Uh, the Red Guard can use healing. The Red Guard will be there, though, so that doesn't quite work. Okay. So, it's not that. Uh, we don't have wind, but I guess it's this one that I'm going to be attacking. I'm going to do like one, two, three to there and attack it. Sure. So, we can do that. I guess I'd rather, like, hmm. I have two move threes here, so either one of these is pretty good. But I'd rather have center mass going forward, even though the one heal here is going to be wasted. Okay. This looks all right. Just again, please no 10. Okay, 39. Sure. All right. So, Red Guard's up. We're going to begin by using the bottom of Warrior of the Sun as an attack 2 against the adjacent... Cultist, really plus one because of the poison. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. I see you. Then we're going to create dark and ice. And we're going to make an attack two with the top of Desert Knight against the same target. Yeah, of course. Of course. Hilarious. All right. Then the Void Warden's up. Um, I actually want to do this first, because if I kill him, then I don't get the curse. Hmm. So if Hatchet goes to here, I can go to here? Is that good? Basically, like we can always take these two spots. Oh, I actually can't. Yeah, so no, I actually have to go here. If I go here, I don't have Hatchet in range, so it's always like this. Alright, so I move to there with the bottom. I consume the dark, and give them a curse, which you never know. Free curse is a free curse is a free curse. And then we're going to gain one experience, and we're going to create dark, and we're going to gift hatchet and attack four. We're going to consume the ice. Um, actually, no, we're going to consume the fire, because we can use the ice in the future, and the fire didn't end up getting used by the red guard there. So we're going to consume the fire to add plus one to this. So this is an attack five with advantage, performed by hatchet, targeting the cultist. Okay, getting rid of a curse is good. So our attack five does six. And then hatchet's up. So on Hatchet, we're going to move first, because we don't want to have disadvantage. So we're going to do a move three with this. We create Earth. And we do an attack three, range two, targeting this cultist. Okay, minus one is fine. Cultist is dead. All right, and that's the end of the round. So then Hail moves. Um, so from here, it's one, two, three. From there, it's one, two, three. Yep, yeah. so Hail will just move to here. We failed that, actually. I kind of forgot. Oh, well. I mean, you know, what was I going to do? I could have opened the door here, but that would be pretty insane. Honestly, this scenario is a hard... Like, to be clear, there are some escort scenarios in Gloomhaven I really don't like. I actually really like this scenario. I think this scenario, like, almost every time I do it, it really comes down... Like, again, it it's what I talked about at the end of the last scenario. It almost always comes down to sort of that sweet spot of just barely making it and, like, having to solve some difficult puzzles in the last room. In general, I really enjoy this scenario. I think it's really well-balanced, and it's like high tension, but very fun. 
but it is also a very difficult scenario without a doubt. So at the end of the day, I took it because the other one was just not possible, but I'm not going to sabotage myself that much. Like if it had been a little bit easier to sabotage myself, you know, what I mean is, for example, if the, the cultist had just been alive with like two health, then I could have just like had the red guard and the void warden go into the next room while Hatchet finished it off or something going into the next round. But I wasn't going to leave it around, let it attack heal itself, etc., just to try to get that battle goal. The scenario is hard enough, and I've just come back off of back-to-back -back losses to the point where I really... I'm playing to win here. Okay, so... One, two, three, four to the door. And... Not do a whole lot, huh? If we gift some movement, we can. We gift movement and go further in. Do we have the immobilized one still? Because it's going to be... I mean... Ooh, but with this... We don't have any shield. <laughs> oh, the joke's on us. No light. Okay, okay. Hmm. 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 Yeah, the problem here is, so we could do this, but we would only have one shield, so immobilizing living spirits next to us wouldn't even be that useful, because they're not going to get retaliated for much. I'm also not sure we have anything better we can do, though, than that. I think accordingly, I'm just actually going to do these two together. Just do this for movement and then this top for an attack. Kind of serves a similar function. Well, how much shield do these have? Well, they have three shields. It's not great. I mean, I don't know. We could flip a curse, or we can flip a positive modifier. I think this is probably a bit better than doing this bottom to immobilize, and then, like, what are we doing on top? Healing ourselves for two here? No, healing ourselves for three? Maybe that's not bad. And then next turn, what do we do? I don't know. Nothing really better. But maybe that's fine. Yeah, that's probably better, honestly. Okay, so that means we're doing this top. And for a bottom, we're not doing a whole heck of a lot. We're just kind of chilling. Again, when you have shield spikes, the top of Signs of the Void is just so good that it can kind of be okay to, to get away with this. Especially here where Red Guard is limited by movement. One, two, three, four. Actually, I think that's enough to reach a Living Spirit. I think there should be a Living Spirit here. Okay. As for us, we've got a follow-through attack. Probably want to keep this. So this is a move two. Yeah, that's enough. We're right next to the door. Okay. So we'll go after and shoot. And then the following turn, we have this and this, which makes perfect sense. What I mean by that is a lot of the times after doing an attack six and then an attack five, most things die, right? So being able to do repeat shot and retrieval in the same turn typically makes a lot of sense because the repeat shot often will kill something if the first attack didn't kill, and then we can pick up the favorite. And if we did kill, then we can theoretically pick up the favorite and then just use this as another attack six. So either way, this works out pretty well. Okay. There we go. So we're going to begin by just gifting the red guard a move three. Oh, sorry, shield one and move two. Sorry. After that, we have a default move here. Um, and we actually can do this sort of because we're cheating. Um, I know what's in this room, right? But again, I, I did say from the beginning of this campaign that I'm not going to pretend anymore as if, like, I'm not I'm not playing the game with myself where I try to like, pretend as if I don't know things that I know. So I know exactly what's in this room. Living spirits and living bones. And living spirits and living bones, neither of them can actually go before 19. So the risk of opening this door is that, like, we're shielding the Red Guard, but then we're going to be on the front line. But none of the enemies in this room are capable of attacking us before the Red Guard goes at 19. So there's actually no risk whatsoever. This just gives us two free movement. Which I would say is worth. So, to the door! Okay. Ah, it's a shame. We're going to get here and immobilize this one. We're not going to be able to immobilize both of them. It would be one more direct damage. That's okay, though. All right, so what are they all up to? Sure. Yeah, all right, nothing special. That's fine. 
Uh, okay, so Void Warden's done. So then hatch or Red Guard's up. So on the Red Guard, we're going to gain one experience and heal ourselves for four. It's, yeah, it didn't. It, we were at 11. It should have been three healing there. And I clicked it three times, but it sort of freaked out. Anyway, and then we're going to do a move four, mobilize target all adjacent enemies. I think that's like better. Yeah. If we didn't, well, at this point, it's definitely better, but oops. Oh, this is fine. One, two, three, four. So close. All right, and we just have one shield from the Void Warden, and that's it. Okay, so then Hatched goes. So here, we're going to use the bottom of Follow Through as a move two. One, two to here. And then we're going to attack the back Living Spirit. Uh, sadly, I don't have goggles. I would definitely use the goggles here. Uh, all right, so I'm actually... I'm, I'm in the process of writing up my... So I, I have a hatchet guide coming on Wednesday for the class discussion. And I'm in the process of writing it up and actually talk about this exact situation, right? Ugh. Which is... So basically, as hatchet, when you throw the favorite, you kind of have to be selective with your targeting to some degree. Hatchet typically wants to kill enemies in a sort of what... I mean, I actually borrow this terminology from League of Legends casters, but you know, when, when you get it right, you get it right. In a fashion that would be called front to back, which is you first focus what's in the front and then you work backwards. In League, this typically means you have to kill the tanky heroes first, and then after that you can kill the squishier heroes behind. Um, hatchet wants to target priority with Hatchet. Good topic. Yeah, it's fair. So basically, there are two, there are three sort of things that can happen when you when you throw the Hatchet, right? Where three sort of situations. Well, really two. What I mean is, you can throw the favorite and you can kill something, or you can throw the favorite and not kill something. Throwing the favorite and not killing something isn't typically such a big deal, because you have, at level 1, you have follow through, and at level 2, you have repeat shot. So you have an attack 4, range 4, and an attack 5, range 3, that benefit from having the favorite in something. So it's not too big of a deal to throw the favorite and hit something, assuming that that's something that you're, you're going to try to continue killing, right? If you throw the favorite on something and you have to start focusing something else, that's really bad. But otherwise, it's typically fine to throw the favorite and not kill something. Otherwise, you can throw the favorite and kill something. Throwing the favorite and killing something is obviously good as well, typically, because the enemy's dead. You can go pick up the favorite and then use it on something else. Where this gets risky is if you throw the favorite at something in a spot that you can't easily access and kill it. Because again, if it's a spot you can't easily access but you don't kill it, that's fine because then you're still going to have sort of two more rounds to get the favorite back. But if you throw the favorite and you kill something and you can't make it there next round, you're sort of going to do nothing for a round, which is sort of an issue that Hatchet has. Accordingly, this is why we typically either fight front to back or in larger rooms we fight around the periphery or we kill things around the periphery where we can easily pick up the favorite. So what I mean here is if I attack this living spirit here, it's very easy next turn, right? If Hatchet or if Redguard moves, which Redguard would have to use a jump because there's going to be bones here, um, we could just go here and do move one, loot one. If even if not, we can just use our boots, which is not such a big deal. This is why having the boots is so incredibly important for fa for Hatchet. Go here, use Retrieval, pick it up here, and then throw it again, right? And this works really well for us. Here, if I attack this one, so this is the more compelling target. The reason for this is because this one's going to attack and get retaliated, so it's going to have one life missing. That being said, since we're making an attack without advantage, we could get a minus one. We do have one minus one in our attack. So this is the target I would rather kill. Um, all things... Else, all other things being equal. But I think this target is actually a trap, because what's going to happen here... Let's see. So the bones have minus one movement on their threes. They have two. I mean, I guess this bone's going to be here, and then this bone's going to be here. So with an enemy here, here, and here, and the favorite here, if it falls on the ground there, this is really tough for us to get. Next turn... Yeah, we don't. we have no way of making it there. So we put ourselves into a bad spot. Ugh. Almost caught it. I mean, almost made the mistake. I literally was just talking about this. Like, to just today and yesterday, I've been writing it, and I talked about this, and then I think I know better, but in reality... <laughs> Sorry, I just got distracted because my cat is being playful. So, while it's going to be slightly less efficient for our party, in the end, our retaliate, our shield spikes aren't going to do anything this turn. It's going to be so much better for the hatchet if we don't attack the living spirit in the back. So the Retaliate is sort of a missed opportunity, but so be it. We just we have to attack this one. We can't attack this one. It's too risky. Um, and if we get a minus one, the damage here, the Retaliate's still relevant. So we'll attack this one, actually, not this one, for the reasons that I just listed. And we'll throw the favorite. And hit number one. Okay. 
Yep, and he's dead. Okay, so this living spirit is going to attack the red guard. I'm pretty sure I did shuffle. I, I always shuffle. Whenever this happens, I doubt whether I shuffled or not, but I always shuffle when I put cards in, so. Okay, so the bones go. This one goes to here. This one goes to here. This one attacks the red guard at plus one, actually. So an attack for four. Minus one, so three. We have one shield. So we take two damage, and this takes one retaliate. Okay. End of the round, and hail keeps on keeping on. Okay, now we're gonna play these cards and we'll see what they do. Picking when to throw the favorite is tough, which is why I cannot stress enough how great of a teammate the Diviner is for the Hatchet Fair. Morning, hey HK Machine. This is not the computer game, what is this? So this is a Tabletop Simulator, um, which is another game on Steam. And it just is basically a physics uh, simulation for playing board games. And so here I'm doing this. I'm using it to play what is called, what a mod called, uh, yeah, I can show this. Um, Gloomhaven Fantasy Setup Scripted UI, which is an incredible mod for TTS, which is free. So TTS is not free. It's a game that costs normally like 20 bucks on Steam and is typically on sale for 10 bucks. Um, and yeah, there's just a, I mean, all of these mods I have here are all free, to be clear. Although some of them are just additions for Gloomhaven. And yeah, it's just uh, you load this up and you play Gloomhaven. And it's actually, it's, it's this one, for example, is incredibly well scripted and very easy to use. It's essentially on, yeah, that's fair. No problem. TTS is sort of, I mean, for the time being, it's definitely better for Gloomhaven just because it has everything and so many more things. You can mod it more easily and add in custom classes and stuff like that. Um, obviously, it is. it takes some getting used to from a user standpoint, though. I mean, both digital, the computer game itself, and DTS are both are great Gloomhaven resources. I mean, here we're just playing our cards, going our earlier initiative. Uh, so here we don't have any gifted attacks except for this. I'm certainly not doing this here. Uh, we don't have dark either. <laughs> As General CGO says. Um, I don't think I need to be doing healing here. I think I'd rather be doing some blessing and stuff like that. I'd rather just hang on to this and play this. Actually, I'm not even sure which one of these cards I care more about. Humorously enough, this is pretty good. Uh, this is not such a high scenario, high movement scenario. I mean, it's going to be for a little bit, but once you start getting into this spot and this spot, you, things really get clogged up and movement isn't that important. So yeah, this is probably better. Basically here, in case I end up short resting next turn, which is a very real probability, I want to make sure that whichever card I play, since these are going to have very similar effects on bottom, whether I play this or this, uh, the card that I play is... Uh, is a card I'm willing to lose, or I'm happier to lose. Okay. Let's go here. Oh, that's the one. I was going to say 55, that's it, isn't it? This is the one you hate. Oh, actually, actually. No, there's two out of our deck. No. All right, we, we've got to kill you. We have to kill you. But that's fine. We will kill you. We will kill you. Okay, and what are the bones up to? Standard stuff. Living spirits aren't generally very threatening enemies. They have two threatening things that they can do. One... No, sorry, three. One is just AoE attacks. They can attack all enemies within range, and this typically leads to a fair amount of damage. It's the summon killer. Two is this, and three is they can attack and stun if they have ice. These are pretty much the only things that living spirits do that are really threatening. And this is one of them. This one is very annoying. Represents a lot of curses. All right, uh, so the red guard's up. So there's not really any need for us to do anything other than... Oh yeah, immobilizing this is actually even good. Okay, so let's start by doing the top of Shocking Advance. We're going to attack the adjacent Living Bones. And plus one. So this is three actual damage, and he's immobilized. And then we're going to use the bottom of Flame Shroud as a move four. So we go one, two, three, four. We don't want anyone to finish adjacent to this, obviously, and because it's immobilized, so it won't hit. And we don't mind advancing through the room and coming over and making sure that we tank aggro for this one. Okay, so we're done. So then the Void Warden's up. I know I do this wrong. I click the one that I'm about to play. That's just how I do it, though. So here we're going to do Poison, target itself for an ally within range 2. Um, 
I could poison hail. I'm not sure that that's a great plan in general. I'm just going to poison myself. Because if I, I, I don't mind poisoning Hatchet, but then I can't Bless and Strike the Hatchet. And I would like to Bless and Strike the Hatchet. So let's do that. Oh, General CGO, by the way, you weren't here for um, for the beginning, or earlier today, on the beginning of my first scenario. You would have been so happy, though. Um, my friend Bebeh, who's another Frost Haven tester and a very good player, actually, when he saw the cards I was using for Hatchet, was like, <clears throat> what, you're not using extra lift? Ah, oh, the range is so good, because normally your maximum range is like three, and there you get range five. And I was just thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> in all fairness though and this this kind of comes back to what we talked about here with targeting priority i'm still not sure that range five is even that useful on hatchet in general i don't know it varies because typically you don't want to put the favorite into targets that are that far away and you don't often want to be making tar attacks that don't involve the favorite but that being said, like I said, I, I'm still trying to keep an open mind and pay attention to when the two win consumers, which one ends up being better. Was that earlier in the day, the range three versus range five? Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, it was at the beginning. It was early in the first scenario, basically, that uh, Bebel saw that I was not, I was bringing the one versus the other. Yeah, I mean, I know range five is nice. I don't know. I just, <clears throat> I wonder. Again, on this class, in general, I found that I don't really want a lot of range. It depends, though. It depends. We'll see. Like I said, I, I'm keeping track of when when I... I mean, so again, all of on Friday, there was never a time where I would have rather had um, extra lift rather than stopping power. There was never an instance where it would have been better. Um, and today, thus far, that hasn't been the case either. But the previous week, there were two instances where I would have rather had extra lift. So we'll see. I don't know. It, it, thus far, it seems like it's really a toss-up. And I, I'm certainly going to mention that in the guide. I don't really think either one is better i don't know the push doesn't end up being super relevant either the biggest my biggest selling point still on why i like stopping power slightly more is simply that in scenarios where i don't need a lot of movement i'm happier to lose the move three wind especially once i'm level three because i have ricochet um and then stop like stopping power without the wind i think is significantly better than extra lift without the wind Yeah. No, no, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I said, the, the range 2 has been limiting before, without a doubt. Like, I don't think it's... I really don't think it's straight up. But again, an attack 2 is also just really limiting. Like, an attack 2 without a bonus is not something you really ever want to do. So, I think either one without the wind, it doesn't matter too much. Um, what was I going to say, though? And yeah, like, the move 3 win, the late initiative is nice, but once you get to level 3, you have Ricochet, which is basically the same initiative. Anyway. Neither here nor there. So on Hatchet, we're going to do the bottom of Retrieval, and we're going to use our Boots. Never has there been a greater combination than the bottom of Retrieval and Boots. <laughs> we're going to go to here, because if we go to here, we get attacked by this. So here we get to grab the favorite. We want to do this, but I'll just leave it up here. I'm going to use it again anyway. Before attacking, so that we can use it for our attack. And then we're going to use the top of Repeat Shot as an attack 3, range 3, targeting the spirit here. We are going to throw the favorite, because we'd really like to, like to not get two curses. So this is going to be attack 6 with advantage because of the strength then given by the Void Warden. See, there I know I shuffled, and I still drew it. It's a really unfortunate draw, both the plus 2 and the boss there, but whatever, at least it dies. At least it dies. Okay, and the favorite goes there. Okay, so now there's just this Bones, which is just going to make him attack 3 on the red guard. Hmm, okay. Ow. No shield, so this is just like that. And oh crap, 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 crap! I actually forgot to do this. I, I still had my move on the Void Warden. Um, I probably would just move to here. I think I couldn't. I wouldn't want to move to here because I would have gotten immobilized. We had four movement, one, two. No, I guess I would just probably move as much as possible. That I even have boots to use, since I... Uh, I'm not sure if... Well, I won't do that or not, but I, I definitely just forgot about the move before. I get distracted talking about other things. Because after we did the blessing and the strengthening, we should have been able to move. I think I would have probably just gone to here. I don't think there was any reason not to, and definitely made sense to move more. Okay, so then we would have finished like this, and then this would have gone here. There's no way I could have blocked this. If I could have, I would have, but unfortunately we went after the hatchet, so 
we couldn't have taken the hatchet spot. This is fine, though. All right. So, where are long rest, where are short rest, is the question. There's too many enemies for three long rest, that's for sure. Void Warden has the least to gain from a long rest, so Void Warden can definitely short rest. Uh, both of us have... Like, Hatchet, it's crazy how important it is. Oh, yeah, we're also... No, no, we're supposed to... Oh, kill one more elite? No, there haven't been any elites yet, have there? No, okay. It's crazy how important long rests are on the hatchet just for the boots. Um, almost any time you have the boots used, you really feel pressure to long rest on the hatchet because, I mean, as you can see, and as you've seen many times, retrieval needs boots. It doesn't always need it, but... It really makes a big difference. At the same time, long resting for Red Guard gives us a lot of retaliate damage and health back. Ugh, this is so rough. The thing is, if we... If we don't long rest, we would have to go here and make a disadvantage attack here, or just attack this one. Maybe that's okay, though. But then this goes here, hits both of us. Uh, I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. It's going to be so hard to long rest after this. What if we just double long rest? And just let the Void Warden take care of business. Yeah! Void Warden can take care of two living bones. Come on! Alright, let's do a double long rest. It's kind of risky, as well. I'm not sure. The problem is that, like, I feel like once we get into this room, stuff starts to get a lot harder, and it's going to be even more difficult to find an opportunity to long rest. So I think I'd really like to take this opportunity to long rest right now. I'm really counting on getting the bottom stun here, to be clear. Okay. Uh, actually, actually, hmm, that is probably one of my three best guards there. No, let's reroll. If I lose the bottom stun, I'm unhappy, but anything else, I think I'm happy. Like, Gift of the Void, it's kind of a wash. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Uh, I mean, we could have seen that one coming, right? I still think it's correct. I mean, like... Obviously, if I'd known that I would get that, I wouldn't re-roll. I still believe it's correct there. This is my... I mean, especially with it being... If it wasn't enhanced, I think I would be more willing to let it go. But the problem is, if you lose this card, you lose, like, one of your two attacks. You just spend a lot of time not killing stuff on the Void Warden, which feels pretty bad, especially on a scenario that sort of is... I mean, has a clock, because if you're, like, you're escorting someone who's always going to keep moving. I think especially on this scenario, it was just too dangerous to lose Wicked Scratch. And again... Legitimately, the only card that I wanted to lose... I mean, this and this is kind of the same, since this is enhanced. Obviously, without uh, Wicked Scratch being enhanced, Gift of the Void is definitely better. With an enhanced Wicked Scratch, I honestly think, like, if I lose one or the other, it feels about the same to me. Obviously, paying one life to lose the other wouldn't be great, but I think it would have been worth paying one life to have the chance not to lose it. Um, to not lose either. And then, obviously, the stun isn't going to be generally super useful. I know it is, because it's our only way of stunning with cultists in this scenario, and it's also really important for my plan of having both of them long rest here, but... <sighs> Damn. Yeah, that, that is rough. That is a really rough one. Okay. So what are we going to do now, then? Um, oops. It's getting a little bit laggy. I guess we're going to Gift of the Void off of Hatchet to kill this one. And we're just going to do it early. We want to do it before 20 then. So that's with this or this. I kind of want to keep the heal, so I think I'll just use this here. Plus gift to the void. Just to kill one of them, and we're just going to leave the other one around since we can't stun it anymore. That's fine. Alright, 25, sure. Void Warden's up, so we're going to use the top of the gift of the void. We're going to create dark. Uh, Hatch is going to lose two life, but he's going to heal um, when he long rests here anyway, so I'm not going to bother paying that life right now. No, I will, because otherwise I'll just like heal him and forget that I can. Okay. So we poison this one here, and Hatchet makes an attack on it. So we don't have plus one because there were no elements to consume for Master Influence. We didn't create any elements last turn, I think. To the best of my knowledge. No, because we long rested. So yeah, this will just be an attack four with advantage by Hatchet. Get rid of a curse. No, no dice. But that's fine. Okay. And... Then we have a default move too. No. No. No reason to take an attack here. Nowhere to move. So be it. All right. So the bones attacks the red guard. Plus zero. It attacks a minus one here, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. You can generally just always memorize these things because the lower initiatives typically in Gloomhaven are going to have minus attack, and the higher initiatives, the later initiatives, are going to have uh, plus attack. 
when they're doing like standard turns. Okay. So long rest, long rest. I've also got to move hail. So long rest heals for two, long rest heals for two, hail moves to here. You don't love against a thing that can multi-target. I'll make it work. Um, yeah, accordingly, this seems kind of tempting, doesn't it? What do I not really care about? Probably like this. Yeah. I don't have that much reason to use the light. So, And I mean, it does consume the light on top, but it's difficult to set up and not that consistent. Um, so I still want move threes for a little bit longer, I think. The AoE can theoretically be good once we get into this next room. I guess it's not even that good because most of the enemies are bones. So let's just get rid of Disorienting Barrage. Again, you always want to get, almost always want to get rid of Barrage before Fancy Hat because Barrage is basically unplayable without Fancy Hat, whereas Fancy Hat is still fine just for a 12 initiative move two or 12 initiative add one to one of your attacks. Neither things are exciting, but they're both fine. Whereas Barrage is not fine. Okay, so... Plan to kill this. Go. Um, so I can retrieval it, but if I retrieval it, then I have to finish on its hex next turn, which is tough, because Hale is going to go to here. Or if we block there, Hale is going to go to here, and then we can't finish on its hex. So throwing the favorite into this is actually... Not great overall. We could give it a little strangling. It doesn't seem bad. I don't oops, I don't mind doing that. Nineteen initiative is perfect actually. It's before it can attack. If it heals and shields, it's a little bit unfortunate, but it's still fine. And then, yeah, we could even just generate a fire for the falling round to then move in with our move four or shield self. Yeah, this looks good for the from the Red Guard's perspective. What about from the rest of us? So in that case, if Hatchet doesn't really want to throw the favorite here, we probably do want to be using Wicked Scratch. Uh, in order to do that, we need to at least move to here. We did create Dark, so we can get a free curse by doing that. With this. Yeah. Seems reasonable. And that goes after Strangling Chain, which is important. And so then for us, so we kind of want to just attack it and then move on top of this. Definitely, in general, if you can save Retrieval, if you can just pick up the coin or the favorite by moving on to the Hex with it, it's better. You can actually just use this and this. Yeah, the initiative here is actually significant. We still have enough move threes that we should be fine. Follow through, I don't feel like is a huge loss here. I mean, it's still just like a move to, hmm. Is there something else I would rather use to move? I mean, like, maybe follow, yeah, follow through is better than stopping power, honestly. Let's just use that to move. This works. So the reason for this is that we do want to go at 24. 24 is significant because it beats the 25 from them, I guess. No, they just drew the 25. Actually, they're almost always doing the 20 or 12 here. I really hope they don't do the 12. I mean, I guess 12 or the 20 are both kind of annoying. No, both of these are annoying. Yeah, well, there's not a lot we can do about that. I mean, I guess there is. I could disarm. Disarm does protect against the 20, but it doesn't help against the 12. I don't know that that's really better. And then we have such a worse turn, we might not even kill it, or we'd have to use the favorite. No, this is fine. So is it that important to attack with center mass then? I mean, it is because we need a range three attack because we want to move here after the attack. We don't want to move here first and then have disadvantage. So I think it's fine to just do it like this. I have never run this scenario as anything other than a cheese opportunity. <laughs> really interesting. I love this scenario normally. Yeah, the 20. Ah, that's bad. That is bad. Okay. It's very frustrating. Very, very frustrating. Hell's going to take some damage here. Have to do some healing at some point. Okay, so anywho, we're gonna do the strangling chain. We're gonna attack the bones here. 
Okay. Well, crit is nice. So he takes five damage. He's immobilized. It doesn't matter. He's also strangled, which means every time someone attacks him, he suffers one. Oh, we were so close. Yeah, yeah I understand what you mean. There are a lot of ways to cheese it. To be clear, the Diviner can cheese this scenario in a sort of hilarious way as well. To some degree. Okay, so yeah, then we do one direct damage. We also loot one. Grabbing this coin before the hatchet can hoover it up. And yeah, this takes one. It's down to one, sure. But unfortunately, then it's going to heal for two. And it's going to attack us and hail. Right. Us, I don't really care that much about. Yeah, sure, we take three. Uh, no, we take two. Oh no! Wait, 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 wait! Oh my god! Oh my god! All right, let me actually show how this really goes. So never mind. This was fine. Oh yes! Oh, you love to see it. You just love to see it. So it flipped up plus zero. So actually, because yeah, I was I was just shortcutting things. But here it's important not to shortcut. So it's actually going to attack us first and then hail because we're a lower initiative. It attacks us. We're actually obligated to use a charge of our hide armor, which we're more than happy to do. So we use a charge of our hide armor, which blocks, gives us one shield. So we're going to then take two damage from the attack. I think that's fine. I think it's fine to save this for afterwards. It's generally better that this is going to be health and damage. So we take two, but we get one retaliate, which actually kills this before it even gets to attack Ale. Mm. And before it gets to heal. Yeah, that crit was actually a really big deal in the end. I mean, we didn't do a lot of strangling there, but we'll take it. We will take it. Bones are done. Void Warden's up. So, well, so much for cursing. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, we're going to do a move three. One, two, three. Getting a Void Warden coin, which I love. Um, hmm. Damn. So basically, Hatchet has to finish here. I would like to finish there to stop Hail from being too aggressive here, but I really want coins on the Void Warden too. <sighs> what happens if Hail goes here? I mean, as long as we go into the room next turn, she won't really be able to advance because we're going to get crowded out. I mean, sort of. I guess we have to go onto the door so that enemies come here. Because if we go here, this actually gives her a path from here. No, it doesn't. Well, it sort of does. She goes here one turn and then here the next turn. Uh, I, I want the coin. I want the coin. I really, I just want coins on the Void Warden every chance I can. I really want to be able to get an item on the Void Warden here. Void Warden and money name a less iconic too. I know, right? That's what's so frustrating is I just desperately need the money on the Void Warden. So any chance I get to loot, I'm really taking it. To be clear, the scenario beating move here is to use the boots to go one more to here to make Hale sort of a little bit more stopped up and make it easier to prevent her from advancing so much. But at the end of the day, we're going to take the chances we can get at minimal cost to loot on the Void Warden. And then we're going to gain one experience and Great Dark, granting an attack to the Red Guard. No, to Hale. There we go. Hale, whack him. Hale just turns around and attacks us. And she's like, wait, I didn't know who you wanted me to hit. Come on, you gave me an attack. All right, then the hatchet goes. So here we just, in the end, have him move two. We have to end here because we definitely need the favorite back. Okay. Discard, discard. And Hale advances more than I would like. Okay. So time to get in the right room. Creating fire. And I guess just shield and shield. Yeah. Set up some direct damage as well while shielding. No one could see that, but my cat just got the zoomies. She's doing the thing where, you know, cats do this sometimes. They just like suddenly start sprinting all over the place. So, oh yeah, she's very suspicious of me right now. Uh, well, you can grant an attack if there's no target possible target. Yes, you can. You can grant an attack, it just doesn't do anything. The ability itself, which creates dark and gives experience, is to give one ally an attack. The ally can't perform the attack. So, for example, someone can't, like, for example, if this card just said attack three, dark, one experience, I wouldn't be able to do that with no ally, with no targets nearby. You can't perform an attack action with no targets, but you can grant an attack to someone who can't, who then just can't perform the attack. You can like, grant something to anyone. The action itself is the granting, not the attacking. The second part is the attacking, but we don't care about that. I miss so much XP. Yeah, it, it is actually an important way to get some XP on the Void Warden, for sure. And also, kind of can create a relevant element sometimes. Okay. 
So yeah, we go in with these two. This just makes perfect sense. Max shield, potentially some direct damage. Get ourselves into a decent position. Theoretically, this could also maybe allow us to go here and pull something to here to, to block off hail like we need to do. Uh, hatchet. I guess Hatchet just wants to move on to the door. So yeah, Void or Redguard probably needs to go here. That's fine. So yeah, because Hatchet needs to move there to be able to attack. So we don't want to go too late because we don't want bones surrounding us. Uh, we do have our boots, but I really don't want to use them for this. This is annoying because the initiatives. Uh, do I have to use my boots? I think I have to use my boots here. It's so important that I make it to this door before a monster does. The problem is there are bones in this room, and if a bones gets here, it's going to start multi-targeting the spell weaver. So I think the safest thing to do here, even though it is frustrating because I really don't want to use my boots for this, is to do that. And then, because the problem is we just don't have another initiative before 25 since we use center mass that turn. So if they do 25, the bones are just going to go there. And this would be bad. I don't remember how many bones there are or where they are. Obviously playing three players, but I think in general, this is just the safest line. Even if it is going to cost us later on not to have the boots for retrieval. So what we attack with is probably... So Redguard's missing a lot of health, but we can just do a heal turn on the Void Warden. I think that's almost certainly what we're doing here. Putting these Blesses into their deck is more costly than usual because Hail can get attacked. Sort of is what it is. Um... Just a default Muti there is probably fine. Just throw away a heal card that we really don't want the following turn. That gives us, yeah, this plus something on bottom the next turn. That's fine. Uh, okay. So what do we attack with? This, we want the favorite in something. Same with this. So I guess it is just this. This is a little bit of overhealing then. But that's fine. I mean, there's also a possibility that we don't even get the heal from this. Hmm. Otherwise, I could just attack with a repeat shot. I guess it's probably not very likely that something in this room... I mean, how much health does an elite cultist have? 15? It's probably not super likely that we put the favorite into it. We then So we make an attack 6, and then we make an attack 5, and then we still need to make an attack 4, because our allies are also going to deal damage. So let's actually just use repeat shot as our lead here, and then go with a follow-through. So just going 6 into 4 should typically be enough with some damage from the red guard. Okay. So, red guard's up. We're going to gain one experience. Consume fire to do a move four. One, two, three. Okay, so there's some new rules, which are spawn one normal cultist for two characters or two normal cultists for three or four characters at sea. Okay, give me some cultists. And C is in the back room in the top right, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, okay. So cultists, and I need to flip four bones as well. Mm, nah, that's pretty annoying, because I really just wanted them to attack me while I have two shield. I don't love it. So we have one more movement. We're always going to here, or to here. Sorry, give me a second, I have to blow my nose. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. I was just speaking to my wife because of the cat. Uh, so I think going here is actually better than going here. First of all, we'll deal... I mean, I guess we can pull. But basically... So the cultist is just doing default. So it's doing move three, attack three, right? So accordingly, we can have it go here and hit us. Having an enemy here is good because it completely blocks off Hale's ability to make it to the next room in any reasonable fashion. Otherwise, if we go here, then Hale's going to move here. Yeah, because with, I mean, yeah, with Hatchet here, yeah. I mean, I guess then we put the monster here. I don't know, it doesn't change too much. It's just The difference is having an ally here technically provides something that Hale can move through, whereas having a monster here provides something that Hale can't move through. I guess on the other hand, at some point, we'll kill this cultist. No, I still think I prefer this. 
Okay, so I'm going to move to there, and then I'm going to do the top of Barbaric Instincts, creating fire. I can pull something that doesn't matter. I do one direct damage to everything near me. This doesn't matter because these things are just healing immediately afterwards. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely with a hatchet attacking a cultist, so yep. So I won't bother to record that damage. Okay, so then the hatchet goes. So we're going to use the bottom of Fancy Hat as a default move 2, plus use our boots for a total of move 3. 1, 2, 3 to here. Uh, oh, no. I mean, the cultist being there, there, it's annoying for the hatchet either way. It doesn't change too much. Um, so I'm not going to use the goggles here, because I'm certainly going to attack the cultist next turn as well. And basically, I, I don't know. How many cult curses are in my deck? least one maybe two mm -hmm. uh, i guess next turn we're actually going to get strengthened from the void warden basically the the point is if i wasn't getting strengthened from the void warden i would rather use the goggles next turn because i'd rather make two attacks without advantage rather than one with advantage one with disadvantage but when when i have curses in my deck like this but because we're gonna get strengthened next turn before we go certainly i actually think it makes sense to use the goggles here so we're going to use the goggles. We're going to target the cultist. Cult is definitely a priority target in this room. Uh, so, yeah. There we go. This is an attack six with advantage because we use the goggles. Get rid of a curse. No, but I'll take that. That's actually better than getting rid of a curse. That's a 12. Okay. We'll take those. Huh. Is there something bad that's going to happen because of this, though? Uh, well, we can... Do we have our boots, right? Yeah, we can make it work. Okay. So the bones go, they all just—they have extra shield, and they heal the damage that we did. Um. Okay, because what's going to happen here is that Cultus is going to attack the Red Guard. We have two shield. I mean, theoretically, we could dismiss the shield. But I'd like to kill the Cultus, actually. So... But the problem is, for example, if the cultist goes here, attacks the red guard, and then dies, Hale's just going to be like, do, 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 and the next turn into the next room, right? So, what we really want to do, we want to accept this, deal the retaliate, because, again, assuming it flips a plus zero, we actually get to kill it with retaliate, which is really good. Um, accordingly, I guess what's interesting is actually it doesn't even need to flip a plus zero, does it? Because you can decide the order in which shield is applied. I've actually been doing this wrong, but this is actually a good point. We can actually choose to use these shields first and then use these shields so that we can always do extra retaliate by spending more shield if we want to. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Because shield ordering is whatever order you want it to be in. Okay, so then... Well, I mean, that doesn't change anything for here. but Well, I mean, it sort of does because it makes us know for sure we can kill it. Because if we move here with the Void Warden, this will still go here and attack the Red Guard. Okay. So... What we're going to do is we're going to do the top of Taunting Fate. We're going to gain one experience. And we're going to heal... Oh, no. Sorry. First, well, sure. We're going to use the bottom of Close to the Abyss as a default move two. Plus use our boots for a total of move three. One, two, three to here. I mean, yeah, we're certainly putting ourselves in a risky position for next turn when we're going to go at 21. Again, it's only the 20 from the bones which will punish us, and that's a one out of eight. So hopefully that doesn't happen. <laughs> And then we gained our one experience already, and we're going to heal the Red Guard for six. Oops. And put a Bless into their deck. With Digital, you always have to use the chest piece first for damage mitigation. Interesting. Okay. The Cultist goes, is going to go here, and is going to attack the Red Guard. Minus two. That's fine. It's still one. We'll take it. So here we can choose the ordering. We'll use this first to negate one damage, so, and then we still have two shield anyway. This is one wasted shield, but it's basically one for retaliate, which is still very valuable here. All right, and the favorite is there. Okay, and we get a curse on the red guard. And I think Hale doesn't get to move at all. Nope. Okay, so earliest possible initiative. We did not create dark last round. Uh, I guess I would rather lose Lure of the Void than lose Give and Take. Although I guess with Give and Take, no, I still have enough movement if I need to. I don't really know the spot I'm in. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're definitely just going to play these two cards. And we'll see. 
I'd rather keep sorry. I'd rather keep resign. Not I was saying give and take. I'd rather keep resign frenzy than lure of the void. And because there's a very real chance I short rest next turn, I can also just use my invis cloak here, which is also a very real possibility. But because there's a decent chance I short rest next turn, I would rather again keep the better card in my hand and play the worst card since they're basically equal. I'm already have my initiative determined. Move the normal cult. It's good catch. Sorry. Yeah, I forgot about that. I forget about them in the back of the scenario sometimes. I'll get that in a second. But basically, yeah, because my initiative is already determined by this card, which I'm playing here no matter what. Um, I don't really... Like, a move four isn't going to be any better for me than a move two. All right. So these have one two movement and one two... No, no, actually, I think I have three movement. Yep. Sorry. So. Boom. All right. Well, they're going to catch up quickly enough. All right, so we have fire here. Hmm, what are we doing with that? Actually, don't have anything to spend fire right now. Hilariously enough, um, but I can jump into the center of them, get aggro on all of them, so that the void warden's not in too much danger as well, and just gain some additional shield. Yeah, against enemies that don't short rest. Ah, uh, we already failed it. We... No, we long rested there. Yep, good call, good call. Thank you, Ross. Yeah, you're right. We haven't long rested yet. Or we haven't short rested yet. Okay, okay. Good call. I will try to long rest. Thank you very much. I always forget that one. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh! No, we didn't kill an elite. Damn it. No, we may not get another chance to either. That's going to be the joke, right? That the only person in the party is the Void Warden. To get their battle goal, it's going to be the Void Warden. All right, yeah, I mean, anyway, this turn definitely makes sense here. I don't really need to be disarming any of these enemies and just shielding up and absorbing some attacks, giving some retaliate is definitely better. Okay. Uh, so for us, so we don't have our boots anymore. Yeah, this is where it costs us. I guess, no, if the Red Guard moves, but then these things are multi-targeting us. I guess if we go late... With retrieval and attack with something like this or this, oh, it's about the same. It makes sense to go late because we don't. We these are all going to be immobilized and focusing the red guard. We don't want to move up to here and let them hit us, but we do really want to use retrieval so we can throw the favorite again this turn. So yeah, I think it makes sense to retrieval and just as our latest initiative here. I mean. This gives us later initiative, but it's also not an attack we want to make, and we need to use Retrieval. We don't need to use Retrieval, but it's certainly better to use Retrieval here, I think. So we'll just go like this. Worst case scenario, we could just, I don't know, default move here to not get multi-targeted by all of them. We'll see. Ah, 46 against 45. Beautiful. Void Warden did already short rest? Damn it. Was it in the first room we short rested? Oh no, we, yeah, we just short rested, didn't we? Yeah, I remember now because we lost this. I thought it was a long rest, but I guess it was a short rest? Yeah, it was a short rest, you're right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, it was when we lost, yeah, it's because when we rolled for this. Did we not long rest that round, actually? No, because it was all at the same time, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. yeah, because without having any stamina potion, ours were all synchronized, so it was that time. Damn it. Well, we're just not going to get any battle goals. They don't call me Mr. Battle Goals for nothing. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> I'm going to do a move to jump, shield oneself. I'm going to go to here, as planned. And then I'm going to use this top, giving shield, light, and immobilizing all of them. Okay. So then the Void Warden goes. So what we want to do here is we're going to poison ourselves, poison targeting ourselves, and we're going to create dark and bless and strengthen the hatchet. Um. Now we just have the question of Invis Cloak or Move Away or Neither. Hmm. Steal the coin. So 
the reason why it would be good not to move away is it prevents the prevents hail from moving up so much but it doesn't actually change too much does it i mean it sort of does because here she'll go here and the next turn she'll go here whereas here she would go here and the next turn she would go here which is definitely a more accelerated pace mm, i really don't want to have to use my viz cloak yet Although i'm not sure how valuable it's going to be i mean i guess i could also just accept this attack problem is they have some blesses in their deck i mean i do have a card to lose in my hand i guess it wouldn't be the absolute end of the world i would be taking an attack four with seven life so literally only a crit would kill me. They have how many crits in there? Just one, I mean two. One bless and one crit. Where's that Iron Helm? Uh, hmm. It's tough. That's really tough, actually. I'm really not sure what's correct. I think slowing down hail is worth it, and I think I think I can do better with my Invis Cloak than this. I'm not actually sure, but I think I can. So I think I'll just accept this. I'll just chill there. Okay, so the bones all go. So it's going to be Red Guard, Red Guard, Void Warden, Red Guard. These are all going to be attack threes. We have two and eight shield and one ability to shield down there. Okay, I miss. And then on the next on the Red Guard is a plus one. So we'll just use this here. So this means we take one. So here it was two damage, here it's three damage, and then this is on the Void Warden. Okay. I was afraid. And now one last time on the red guard. That's fine. That's where I like to see the blesses. Whew. Very, very close there. A little too close. Uh, because we have our helmet. So we take one and this takes two. All right. Their respectable turn. Okay, so then the hatchet's up. So we're going to do a move one, loot one going to here, looting both of these things. I'll grab this coin. I'll just leave the favorite up there because I'm going to use it again shortly. And then I'm going to attack. It's annoying because this one doesn't die unless I flip a plus one. Hmm. That's tough, actually. Whereas this one dies with a plus zero, but obviously I don't have advantage. And I have curses in my deck, which is what scares me about this. But I can't attack before moving, because I certainly... Also, I guess it's just easier for me to get the favorite here than here. Sure. Let's attack this one, then. So we have both advantage and disadvantage. Here goes. Oh, brutal. Oh, that's really brutal. All right. So he's favorited, and we get to do a heal, too. And I think it just makes sense for it to be on the red guard. I mean, yeah, healing the poison off the Void Warden is interesting, but I'm not even sure we care about healing the Void Warden, whereas we do care about healing the red guard. Damn, that's rough. What would the other card have been? Yeah, I guess we could see, since we're going to redraw anyway. Plus zero. Well, so we wouldn't have killed this one either, but it would be at one life. Admittedly, we don't have a direct, like a one direct damage thing this turn, so this would still, like, I don't know. It was... Fortunately, neither outcome would have been amazing here. But the other outcome still would have been better, obviously. Still, I think that this was a reasonable choice. Like, I don't think it was necessarily wrong to do this. I guess I should take a look at what the odds... I mean, like, I think I have just one curse in my deck, right? I have two curses in my deck, but one bless. So we had, what, 19 cards in our deck. And with flipping one card... There were, I mean, no, I guess the advantage doesn't matter. So flipping one card, we had one, two, three, four possibilities of not killing. So four out of 19. Yeah, it's pretty good still. I mean, obviously, just slightly above 25%. Whereas if we'd attack the other one, our odds of killing, we would have one, two, three. So hold on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven total cards in our deck. Yeah, so it would be under 19 so one minus open parentheses uh 12 divided by 19 times um 11 divided by 18 yeah because we would have to draw 12 out of 19 and then 11 out of 18 in order to fail i don't know i'm not sure uh, I'd have to do the math. I think ours was slightly better. There's also one other thing to consider here, which is, was kind of what the tiebreaker was for me, which is basically that having the favorite here was better than having the favorite there. Okay. Um, 
so there's just the cultists now, which are back here, which suffer some damage and do some summoning. There we go. And then Hale advances to here. In truth, though, there was a mistake made that turn, right? Actually, I, I just hadn't thought about everything through all the way in advance. But the correct thing to do then, the reason why we got into this spot, and it all would have worked out much better for us if we'd done it appropriately, we should have waited to use the shield here, especially because they'd already drawn their miss. Um, so we knew that this one would hit. I mean, theoretically, I think there's already the minus two out as well. So we should have waited for this one to use the shield rather than just using it on the first attack here. And if we'd used the shield on this one, then we would have attacked there and we would have killed it. Everything would have worked out better if we played better. Yeah, see? Definitely make mistakes still. Okay, so at this point, there's nothing to be lost by short resting, since we've already failed our battle goal, so we will short rest, because we're definitely in a precarious spot. Um, sure. I don't have... I mean, the biggest reason you want give and take is because of the bottom stun. Don't have the bottom stun anymore, so... I don't think there's any reason to do anything but play our two cards. Same here. This ship sucks, but... What can we do to affect this situation? So, Hale's moving in, so we actually have to go in there. Jeez. Yeah, this is where stuff gets tough once you let Hale kind of advance here. But there was no... I mean, the problem is we had to get the favorite. Ugh. Yeah, Hatch made things harder for us here. This is going to be bad. Because these enemies aren't even going to be close to dead yet. Um, hmm. If only this was with me controlling the actions. Resign Frenzy is not really what we want. So I have to move on to the door this turn with someone. And I guess that someone is not going to be the Red Guard. I mean, it can be, I guess. Because we could disarm one of these and then just jump over there. But I think it's most likely actually just going to be... What are we doing? I mean, I guess it can be Hatchet. Who does it, actually? It's, it has to be someone who goes in Viz, I think is the best call. So Hatchet can actually do it to attack from here to there, because we need to move away anyway to lose disadvantage, and I think that's better than like moving down here. So accordingly, Void Warden doesn't need to move. <laughs> Did we create dark last round? I actually use give and take. Could play the bottom loss on Lure of the Void. I don't actually hate that here. We're also at eight cards, so playing a loss here is pretty reasonable, and we definitely need tempo right now. Uh, so accordingly, I really need a top with better initiative to make this worthwhile. Oh, this is adjacent, or it's within range three. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So why don't we just then do something like this on top, just to give the red guard a bit more shielding this round, which works pretty well and gives us an early turn. Okay, 20. That's fine. Mostly. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're up first on the Void Warden. I think I'm always doing this first. Again, unknown information before known. Uh, this is always the part of the scenario where I start to hate it. I actually like the length, but it's so hard when she's going to open that door too fast every time. Yeah, yeah. This is this is where it gets really hard, without a doubt. Let's consume the dark here. Yeah, we don't need the light either. So we're going to consume the dark. We're going to end up consuming the light as well for master influence on this attack. We're going to gain two experience. Um, one ally within range. So it's going to be you who suffers a bit of damage. Again, maybe it should be the hatchet. I guess there are more curses in the Red Guards deck. Hmm. There are more curses in the Red Guards deck. Yeah, let's have the Hatchet suffer the two. Alright, so Hatchet gets to perform an attack seven, plus we use the Light with Master Influence. This is going to be an attack eight with advantage, targeting this Bones right here. Again, we'd rather leave the one with the favorite in it, because we get the follow-through bonus. Alright, so here goes. 
nothing special to use on this. Okay, all good. This one is very dead. And then, oh, so we're actually gonna get, so we do have to go and Viz here as well. Or we have to pitch a card to the incoming damage. It's annoying. Uh, yeah, sure. So then we're going to one ally within range three, we perform shield one and move two. So we're going to let the red guard. Hmm. Do I want to use my jump boots now and just go to the other side right away? The disarm's actually not doing anything because they went afterwards. It could also just go into the next room with a red guard this turn while we clean her up in here. Why don't we do that, actually? That seems okay. So let's go there with the red guard with this move using the jump boots. Okay, so the red guard has shield one and did this move too. And again, I think here... So this one will always just hit there. This one will hit these two. Yeah, th this is pitching a card. I think it's going to be better to use the invis cloak than to pitch a card. Especially if the red guard's running into this next room. Can you throw Hale back? I don't remember if she's an ally. She is an ally, but unfortunately I can't throw her back is the thing. Because I don't control... It's the same ally may perform move two. So to be clear, if I gave her a move two, she would actually run forward, not back. Since it's not me controlling the action. It's her. And so in that case, when you give it to allies like this, they just move towards their focus. And her focus is the altar. Okay, so the living bones go. Uh, so nine attacks the red guard and then the void warp. No, just the... No, sorry, the red guard and... Hatchet. Red guard first, and then hatchet. Ooh, jeez, okay. So red guard had one shield. We have no other innate forms of shield here. So plus one out of three is four, so three actual damage, and it's retaliated for one, and this one attacks the red guard as well. Minus one. So we have one shield and minus one, so it's just one damage and one retaliate. Okay. And they each heal for two. Yeah, this is getting hard. All right, then the... Oh, crap, there's also the bones behind. But they actually, fortunately, don't move very much. This was actually good in that regard. This one can't even move. So then the cultists behind, I think they have minus one move when they do this. Yeah. So two movement. One, two. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Red guard goes. All right, before I bust into this room, I really need to go quickly so I'll just go to the bathroom really quickly and be right back
Uh, flurry of Blades, for sure. 100% of the time. Always. Definitely Flurry of Blades. Both halves are better than both halves of Gruesome Advantage. I don't even remember what the other half of Gruesome Advantage is. I know one of them just upgraded back. Yeah, it's just like a move 7 and then the upgraded back step. Yeah. Definitely Flurry of Blades. Both halves of that are both better than both halves of Gruesome Advantage. But I can talk about it more after the scenario for sure if you want a better explanation than that. Okay. Um... Yeah, for sure. So, hatchets up. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it still wouldn't even be that tempting. But, well, we'll talk about that afterwards. Just because Flurry is so much better. We're going to move to here. Anyway, well, I guess, yeah. Basically... The reason why it wouldn't even really be that tempting, even if it had good initiative like Backstab did, is because the Scoundrel doesn't lack for movement with good initiative. You have plenty of that, but something that gives you very good initiative while also giving you advantage is just a huge upside, and also the flexibility of sometimes attacking from range. So in general, like an upgraded Backstab wouldn't really help you that much. It would just be like a marginal upgrade, whereas Flurry helps in many regards, both with like guaranteeing your giant boss killing attacks, and also just gives you a bunch of useful range attacks in a number of scenarios. Okay, we gain one experience, and we make an attack for range four, targeting this bones here with follow through because it has the favorite in it. Yeah. Okay, so three damage. And end of the round. Oh crap, nope, nope, nope. I just skipped the red guard's turn. All right, that's fine though, that's fine. Sorry, it's because I clicked the red guard before. I mean, what happened here had no bearing on what the red guard was doing. We were running into this room, as we planned, since the void, since the hatchet was going to move down there in the end and not go invis. Um, grab, grab, grab. All right, so we're going to use the bottom of Healing Sands to do a move three. One to here. Did red guard go? Nope, yep, we just completely forgot about it. doing it right now. Okay, uh, so we also have to spawn a living spirit or two. So it's just one normal living spirit at D. D is there. Okay. Mm. Oh no. So D is there, so it actually. Ah, no, but it, in this it can't actually spawn there, so it will spawn here. So we need to flip for them. They're out too. Yeah, sure. Okay, um, yeah, sadly, it's going to whack hail. And there's the corpses. Okay, that's fine. So we have two movement left with a red guard. Do we have, we have lure of the void still, right? We do not. Yeah, we do. No, it's in our discard. Oh, we just... Oh no, we just no, it's actually in our loss. We just played it as loss. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just forgot to click loss on it. Oh no, how am I gonna put these through the traps? How am I gonna put them through the traps? I mean I think regardless I want them to well no, the question of whether I want them to stay near the traps or not depends on my ability to put them into the traps. I don't think I have any push on the red guard. Pull. 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 No, so we have no push on the red guard. We do have plenty of push on Hatchet, but Hatchet's pretty far away. So for the time being, we're just going to kind of have to deal with them being there as they are. So we've got push there, and push on the bottom of follow through, and push on the top of stopping power. We do still have stopping power, okay. So we've got a lot of ways to push. So it's basically going to be up to Hatchet to use to activate those traps. And the traps, I think, are like damage and poison, if I'm not mistaken. Not just damage. Okay, it's just the green makes me think poison. So I definitely do want to keep them as close to the traps as possible. So we probably just want to go to here. Uh, the disarm attack isn't really going to do anything but so it, obviously in the end it would have been better to attack first but i couldn't know i knew that there were corpses in here and i didn't want to run the risk of them smacking me for a million so i certainly moved first i could stop here but then it's going to be hard to put them into the traps whatever the disarm attack is still just an attack too okay so let's just attack the elite because it's more threatening since it has an eight poison yeah Yep, yep. Even though it has more health, it's just typically going to be more threatening. So we're going to create ice and dark, and we're going to make an... Uh, actually, 
I guess I've already seen what they're doing this turn. Am I going to use the Ice or Dark on the Void Warden next turn? I can before they do their stun attack. I'm just afraid of creating ice because they can stun, but it should be fine. All right, so we're going to attack the corpse here because the, the I could just do a default attack here because obviously the disarm does nothing. Beautiful. Okay, so no damage. It's disarm. This doesn't matter. Okay, so the red guard's done. Technically, no. Uh, well, then these go and then the hatchet would go. Again, we've already done the hatchet's turn, so it's not a big deal. It's muddle and immobilize that go here. Then the Living Spirit goes, it has minus one movement and minus one range, so two movement, two range, but that's still going to be enough for it to whack hail with an attack for four because of plus one. Not a blood. That's fun. This is why, to be clear, in modern Gloomhaven design, this sort of scenario would always have the stipulation that you can lose cards to negate damage to the character you're escorting, which is just generally speaking a better design because it prevents losing to random nonsense like this. Again, like the problem with this is this is typically how things are supposed to be set up. I mean, yeah, all right, you could have your character run back here and tank the attack, but this is also pretty nonsense because, I mean, then she's still going to run up here. I mean, I guess she's not because this was the go here or whatever, but it still puts you into a really bad spot. It's weird how you can pitch for half the scenarios in base game, but the other can't for the other half. Yeah, I don't know. I think it wasn't super well thought through, to be perfectly honest. In general, I think being able to pitch is just a good mechanic to have because it again, it just again losing cards to negate damage is still painful, and escorted characters still put themselves in situations that you wouldn't typically put yourself in. So having to pitch cards to keep them alive is still very costly, but it's obviously like still kind of evens out the randomness. This is terrible because to be clear, with this crit. The scenario is basically over here because now she goes here and these can just come and kill her. Like It's very difficult to prevent these, these, and this all from attacking her when she's at two life now. When any single one attack kills. That's just, uh, I don't know. I mean, that, that crit basically seals the scenario and I don't think it was something that we were supposed to be able to play around. Again, the only way we could have done that is like open here and then, no, we couldn't even. We don't even have enough movement. We could have gone one to here. And then like this, but she was actually on that spot. And we don't have the boots to go one more movement, so we wouldn't have even been able to make it to the other side to prevent that attack. So again, I guess if we had done... If Hatchet could have gone earlier this round, then we could have opened the door in Viz, and then Redguard could theoretically play around this by going to here. But it also, like, with a three-character party, it's difficult to imagine a situation in which you should run someone back this way. The scenario suddenly got bad. Surprise. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I, I know that this is going to happen. And this thing spawning and attacking hail is something I'm prepared for. Again, this is something that typically attacks for three, right? So one attack from this on hail doesn't typically change the scenario too much, especially because I can heal her. But it just went from, like, I mean, her at 10 life to her at 2 life in a single monster action because of both getting a plus one attack and a crit. This is just what's unfun about this. Uh, okay. I mean, we just have to heal her now. But... Okay. If we're healing her, we're not killing things in this next room. This is still has the favorite. This is just a mostly unwinnable spot. I'm sure you did get super screwed instead of normal screwed. Yeah, I mean, again, like I said, typically I play this scenario and just barely win or just barely lose. Um, this was... The, I mean, I, you're expected to get screwed a little bit, I think, and that's fine. This was really the high end of screwed. Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely can't be long-resting on anyone right now. Um, no? Mm. Yeah, sure. I mean, we, fortunately, here we have another move four, so it's easier for us to lose this. Here we definitely, you just can't lose retrieval. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing, because that's basically... that. That is actually straight up my two... Oh, I don't have one life. I Never mind, I can't reroll. I mean, I'm certainly not pitching two cards to reroll. I forgot I was at one. Well, I guess I'm not losing this. Never mind. But that is hilarious, to be clear. Again, I wasn't actually able to do this. I just forgot I had only one life. Um, I mean, technically I could, but I would have to pitch two more cards. That's obviously never worth it. I just wasn't paying attention. Got a little bit distracted here. Uh, yeah, like... So the best... My best card is repeat shot right now. My second best card is re retrieval, to be clear. So going one into the other was actually just insane luck, but yeah. 
Hey, McWiggity. Alright. There we go. There we go. Welcome to the stream. Thanks for the follow. I'm glad you're enjoying. Alright. So then, we need to kill this. We need to kill it before it can go. I think those two doors being a bit further away would help. The last room is going to be a pain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't think that would be the worst idea. All right, well, we need to go as early as possible to kill one of those things before they can possibly go, and we need to attack it with follow through, which typically should be enough. Again, this has two life, so even on a minus one, follow through kills. <laughs> hey, McQuiggity, thank you very much for the, the Prime subscription. I do really appreciate it. Uh, again, I'm really glad you're enjoying the stream, and thank you very much for the support. All I have to do is just have bad bad luck scenario after bad luck scenario, and people take pity on me and give me subs. So that's my plan in the future. I'm just going to always stack the decks in TTS so that it always goes poorly for me. Next level plays. Okay. Um. So what are we up to here? Sorry, just warming up my hands a tiny bit. I think... Hmm. <laughs> hey, flame lord. Thank you very much. I I really appreciate it. I know you've been around for a while. Again, it's really kind. Thank you very much. I appreciate the subscription. The the pity party bandwagon. I'll take it. I will take it. Thank you. All right, so we're definitely not attacking with a red guard here. We're always playing a top shield. That's a given. The real question is what we do on bottom with a red guard and which top shield we play. I guess the one direct damage is probably better than the immobilize. There's not really a lot to be gained by the immobilize here. So, yeah, one free damage is one free damage, right? And then that also theoretically sets up a strangling chain. So there's kind of three reasonable bottom choices. No, four reasonable. There's the disadvantage on all their attacks, because they attack for a million. Shield is a little bit less valuable, but shield is also retaliate. I mean, I guess the shield is strictly better than this. This does one direct damage, but we're already getting fire, and this also does one damage, but also protects us. I think ultimately mitigation's got to be better. And while this is also a form of mitigation, and typically against large attacks, this is a little bit more valuable than this, um, this also does damage. Okay, so... Ah... Ah... How does Hale not die here? <laughs> um... This is so good here, though. This top, actually. It's crazy to play another loss, but we're in such a bad spot. Ah, uh, So we can actually... How much damage are on these traps? So the traps are at level 4, so I think they're going to be 6 damage. Yeah. So this top is actually an execute on the elite corpse, which is definitely worth... Yeah, I mean, I could also make an attack here instead of executing. And then stun him and do direct damage. I mean, we'll see. I, I should play this no matter what. I definitely need to play this. I wish I'd lure the void, but I don't. And so this is going to have to just stand in for lure the void. One, two, three. So I already have range on him, so I can just do whatever bottom I want. This also gives me pretty good initiative. I don't know if I'm able to play around the 20 from them. What can I do with a bottom action here? Hmm. What's the problem? I got I just like no one can tank this thing is the issue. Whoever's getting hit by this is losing a card. And we can't let it hit Hale either. The Red Guard can't help because he's immobilized. Hmm. 
I think just making another small attack is probably worth it. I guess I don't want to use an early initiative though here, because actually, yeah, I, I need early initiative every time. Actually, let's just do Gift of the Void as a bottom heal and hope that that maybe makes a difference here. Again, we're not playing around the 20 initiative this way, but I'm in such a bad spot, I can't afford to play around a 1 out of 8 here. That's just not possible right now. Because, yeah. We can heal Hale with this, which typically should keep her alive. We'll see exactly what happens. Otherwise, there's always the possibility of us just moving here, but in that case, we can play any bottom, and I think Gift of the Void isn't looking very good considering our current HP pools. Okay, I don't think we can do better than this. Let's go. Oh, maybe we should switch the red guard, what the red guard was doing. Oh, too late now. Um, <laughs> well, that's interesting. I mean, couldn't they just take a turn off here, you know? Just do the thing where they, you know, don't move or where they don't attack. What are you up to? Target all enemies. Okay, uh, so that is basically, I mean, so we have to heal Hale here. That's just insane. This is so insane. Cultist doesn't really matter. Corpses are attacking without moving. Okay. Well, for the Red Guard, let's see here. The spirit laughs at your foolish lands. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's sort of insane what the spirit has done across two turns. Um, I do really regret playing these cards, like playing the cards the way I did here. So is it just better to make attacks now, is what I wonder, rather than just shielding against one attack? The real question is how I want to make this behave. So yeah, it is a shame I don't have the push on the red guard. I mean, the push on the red, well, yeah, because then I could stun this. Yeah, 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 I know. Sadly, I don't. I mean, does the red guard even have push? I mean, no. Could we have had push? No, we don't. I mean, yeah, just this, which we would have had to have light this round, which we couldn't have known. So, yeah, I mean, there's just the, not very likely we would have push on the red guard, I think, no matter what. And unfortunately, pull just really doesn't do it. Uh, okay, so I think the best thing to do is actually to only move this through two traps, because then we get an additional attack four with advantage here, and just make some, and also it poisons, yeah. Yeah, I think that's better. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Shield of the Desert, I think, is fine as a card. It's just that, yeah, it's too... It's a bit random for the push to line up with when you really need it. All right. So, wounding it is actually really good. I guess we'll see. Let's let's start by doing Swift Strength top, then. And we're going to attack both of these. We'll do... It, they're both... Just, we're always attacking with disadvantage here. It doesn't matter. I just need a little bit of damage on this target, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, at least we got the curse out of there. So, now on the normal... <sighs> Come on. All right, and now the wound attack here. <laughs> ah. I mean, this was sort of insane flips that we somehow managed to do no damage on all three attacks. So this, okay, sure, why not? But then this with... <laughs> Oh, I'm going to lose it. That's really unfortunate. I just really needed, like, basically, what I really, 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 really had to have happen was I just needed, from all these attacks, to do one single damage on him. And I'll explain why. He's going to take 12 damage from the traps, and he's going to wound, so he's get, by wounding him and stunning him, he's going to take 2 damage from that. Is that every single negative in my deck? I guess I have a reshuffle so I can go look. I think there's more curses in my deck, to be honest. But this is every single negative non-curse, at least. I think there's like one curse left. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's that's how we drew there. So there was one curse left. Other than that, we drew every single negative card in our deck. Oh my god. It is just... It has not been my last my my days these last couple weeks playing this. So to be clear, yeah. So basically, if we get a single damage on either of the attacks on this elite it takes one it goes down to 14 the wound will deal two damage to it before it ever acts again the traps will deal 12 
So this means it dies, and we get to basically get the big attack here, while, like, sort of get to have it all. So I just needed, I needed an attack two or an attack one, one of these single two things to deal damage here. But in the end, not only did they do not do any damage here, but I also managed to not deal any damage here by drawing, like, just literally perfect disadvantage modifiers. Oh, God, that's just so bad. I mean, like, otherwise, the thing is, I could do this, which is theoretically one damage, but then I don't get the wound. So it, it doesn't actually do it. I needed to get the wound and then one damage from one of the two attacks. Whatever, we'll just have to put this as a problem for future us, because I still think it makes more sense to attack the other thing. All right, well, we're done. We did basically nothing on our turn there. Pretty impressive. Do I want to heal? I guess there's really no reason not to just be healing right away. Anytime... Uh, Void Warden can do healing from now on. It's going to be on hail, so we might as well use this now. I don't think we're going to get poison, but you never know. Okay, hatchet's up. So we're going to gain one experience. We're going to make an attack four, range four. We're going to be targeting the bones here. Well, that's actually a fine minus one. So the favorite goes there. So how do we... I mean, I don't know. I guess we're just dying here. I don't understand how we can not die here. Is basically the issue. <laughs> because of what the bones flipped. And, like, basically this combination of things is just so insane. Um, hmm. I mean, we have to go invisible here, no matter what. And I guess we just have to get the favorite. So we're just going to do a default move two and go there. Should I have considered using the top? No, the top is only two shields, so it still wasn't enough against two attack threes. If it was one shield higher, maybe. All right, we get that back. We get this back. Pop our invis cloak. And is there anything we need to stand a potion back right now? Mm, not particularly right now. I mean, like, yeah, early initiative. I don't know, maybe early initiative. No, I think it's fine for now. Probably just need to get back bigger attacks. Okay, Void Warden's up, so we're going to lose our invis here. So... We're going to use the top of Suggestion. We're going to gain two experience. We're going to consume the ice. Oh, where are you? We're also going to consume the dark for Master Influence here. We're going to make this elite here perform move three, attack three, but we're just going to have it end here. Again, I think it getting this attack is better than it dying. It's just going to have one health. It just needs to be tickled at some point, basically. So it takes 12, which puts it down to three. And then it's going to attack the regular living corpse. This is normally a three, but I've consumed an element. So this is an attack four with advantage, targeting the regular living corpse using my modifier deck. Okay. So five damage. Yeah, I mean, I think that's got to be worth it. And it gets stunned. And I have no choice but to heal Hail here with my bottom heal two from this because of this attack. Otherwise, if that flips a plus zero or higher, then it's killing. Then we just straight up lose the scenario and there's nothing we can do about it. So this is a 100% force choice here. Um, I'm going to have to lose two cards, maybe three. So if I have to lose three cards, I think I'd rather have used a stamina potion here. So this is loss no matter what. So Because then I just get another turn. Uh, I guess early initiative next turn is kind of the most important thing. So let's get this back. I don't know how much any of this matters, though. All right. So the corpse goes, suffers, damage. Oh, we could have not. No, 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 no. I didn't stun it. I didn't stun it. I can just not. Uh, I mean, it doesn't matter. that I, I forgot. I wasn't paying attention to what they do. No, no, no. All right. So it was fine. It was fine. It was fine. I forgot that it was. I see now the 32. Okay. So I, I just not use the stun portion. The stun portion wasn't tied to an experience, was it? No. So I gained all the correct experience. Just I won't use the ice consumption. Whatever the ice is there, it doesn't matter. Because this is actually, this works out then. So he actually suffers one damage from his wound, and then one damage from his action doesn't get to hit anyone. This one suffers one damage and attacks the red guard. Okay, I would rather see those later, but whatever. So it's an attack for plus two, so normally six, minus one, so five. We have no defensive items. So we'll take the five, and we get pushed. Okay, 
Living Spirit. So Living Spirit has range three, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so it just needs to move to here to be able to hit Hail as well. And again, we are using Jaws the Lion line of sight rules because I think, uh, no, basically payment line of sight still actually is fine here, right? It's a bit weird, but yeah, that's easy enough. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So it's first going to hit the Void Warden and then the Spell Weaver. I really need to say a negative modifier on the Void Warden here. Nope. So this is a two, but we have poison. So three. So did I lose a card? Um, sure. I don't think it matters too much. Okay, then on hail. And that's the scenario. The Living Spirit attacked hail twice and crit both times. I don't even. I just... Again, crit magnet. Yeah, yeah, I could have stunned this so that it wouldn't attack Hale, but then this is so much worse for us, to be clear. And again, only a plus two or a crit actually kills Hale here. Which is, given how bad of a situation I'm in, I think not a spot in which I'm supposed to be playing in a, playing around a 1 out of 10. But this is what happens. Man, that sucks. I'm glad you guys are doing the frost and stuff to prevent that kind of stuff. Yep. Oh, don't you worry. I'm, I've had a very similar experience to this, actually, this past week. Dealing with an escort scenario while testing frost haven. I mean, again, this is vague enough. I don't think anyone really cares. And there was similar... I mean... Not this feedback. Definitely that sort of thing has already been understood, to be clear. Like, I don't... I'm not super worried about this sort of thing happening, but there were some other issues that had to be ironed out. Yeah, exactly. Like, to be clear, if we had the card loss mechanic tied to her in this scenario, this is completely different, because we would have just negated one on the eight, and then we would probably still negate on the four here. No, we'd probably accept the four. We would have just negated the eight, and we would be in a much better spot here. Yay for playtesting, exactly. Which is weird... I mean, in all fairness, though, I guess these scenarios were never playtested at such high difficulties. So, uh, okay, well, that sucks. Man, this is rough. We've lost the last three scenarios in a row. I mean, we're definitely not playing on the wrong difficulty here either. It's just, I don't know, sometimes bad stuff happens. All right, uh, so that's it. I guess, no, we've already all finished, yep. So battle, no, game setup, scenario lost. Did we finally get a level here? Still not, we're never, is it just not giving experience over here? No, I think it did. I guess we just barely gained any experience. We gained experience replacing the favorite. How is it that people, I still don't get how people think this is the... Well, I mean, I guess maybe it is. It's just not my experience playing it. That this is the highest experience gaining class. Look at this. How, look how far behind he is. He's still... I mean, Void Warden's at 114, and we're sitting down here at 88. Oh, Flame Lord, I'm sorry. What? You must have typed in caps or something? I don't know what... Or maybe it was a, a spoiler thing. I, I Sorry, I didn't see why you got timed out, and I apologize. All right. Um, and around... So is there any post stuff we have to do? Not really. We should have gained the gold. We're still slightly short of enhancement there. Slightly sh a bit short of buying anything we want here. Uh, 72 gold. Did it? I feel like it just gave us a bunch of gold. Is that correct? I didn't have that much before. Did I really pick up that many coins in this scenario? I feel like it's maybe... Uh... Oh. So to be clear, everyone, I don't think this mission is generally horrible. Like I actually like this this escort scenario. I enjoy playing this scenario in general. I think I find it fun. Here I didn't, but it was just because of a random crit. And yeah, I mean that's gonna come up one out of twenty times, I guess. Oh, confirm. Okay, let me check. Uh, Hatchet got nine gold. We had sixty-three gold before. Why didn't we do an enhancement? I could have sworn I didn't have that much gold before, but I guess I did. Four XP. Yeah, okay, that seems correct then. Good call. Thank you for that. Can make it larger. Yeah, 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 no, I know. I just, but I could read it there. It's fine. 
Okay, uh, well, I think I can cut the VOD then. I don't, there's no post scenario stuff to do on VOD. So to everyone who's watching the VOD, sorry that, um, I mean, I'm not really proving that I'm a good Gloomhaven player, I guess. But thanks for watching anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that'll be it for this week. Unfortunately, these will be coming out pretty early in this week. So you're going to have a long stretch for people who watch the VODs before the next ones. Because the next VODs won't, like, I won't be playing this campaign again until next Friday. Uh, so a week from this Friday. So it'll be a while until there are more VODs. So apologize, apologies, especially apologies, because, yeah, I mean, neither of the ones today were... No, I mean, this one was close. This just, like, in two turns went from, yeah, we're doing perfectly fine, to, oh, we lose. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, thanks for watching. Take care, and see you again soon.